since it is nine o'clock on my end here. Um, appreciate everyone coming out. This is the 2021 South Carolina Tobacco Production Meeting. Um, my name's Matt Edmund, your tobacco agronomist for South Carolina. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers uh, for participating. Uh, I want to thank William and uh, David for kind of organizing this thing. Um, Josh is on the, the uh, computer hosting in. He's the gatekeeper for all this. Um, so appreciate him doing that. Um, as far as the agenda for the day, I'm gonna start out uh, myself just giving an overview for the 2020 season. Um, William's gonna talk about um, some greenhouse management. Uh, Dr. J. Michael Moore is gonna talk about a few different things, um, agronomic and pest management. Um, Dr. Francis Ray Jones is gonna talk uh, insect management. Um, Dr. Adam Kantrovich will give us uh, the Dubaga outlook, economic side of things. And then we'll wrap up with Chris Stevens um, at Farm Plus and talk about some of the, the big insurance changes uh, for this year. So I'll, um, for that, I wanted, we wanted to make sure the sponsor slides, we obviously being virtual um, this year, um, didn't ask for any sponsor money, but wanted, uh, he wanted to make sure that we thank our sponsors uh, from the past couple of years and uh, hopefully, um, you know, we can kind of get back to normal uh, next year. But I wanna, again, thank you all for participating. I know this is uh, definitely a new way to have production meetings, um, you know, probably not new um, going through last year into now, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think if, if you're gonna go to a grower meeting or any kind of at least extension meeting for this year, this is how it's gonna be. Um, so we've, we've definitely had to adapt this past year, many aspects of our lives. Um, but I know there can be some challenges there, but we'll get through it. So um, before I get started, just a few housekeeping rules here. Um, you all should be muted and video off. Um, just to, again, keep, uh, keep down on disturbances and all that. Um, if, uh, I think that's on our end, but but again, as I said before, please uh, try to keep your mic muted and your video off. Um, creates better internet. You know, I know we got some uh, definitely some places uh, with uh, unstable internet, so that helps with that versus everybody having their their video turned on. Um, but we do do want to keep dialogue going. We do want you to ask questions. That's what we're here for. Um, any comments? Um, gripes, complaints, anything, uh, feel free to ask. I think the way this is we're going to speak, all the speakers will go through at the end of each speaker. Um, we'll have a chance um, if, if time for questions. Um, and then definitely at the end of all the speakers, um, we should have plenty of time again, um, more than enough time to, to for some Q&A and, and again to have that dialogue. Um, with that, the chat box is there. Um, again, if you've never used it, you know, there should be in, in your toolbar chat, you can ask a question at any time. Um, if you think of something, go ahead and throw it in there and then we'll get to it um, as soon as we can. Um, and, and again, it, that should be, uh, should say uh, to everyone in meeting, that, that's gonna, everybody will see that. If you wanna send a, um, a a message to your neighbor privately, make sure you're in a private box or, uh, you know, maybe just, just text them. That's what I do. So, uh, but anyways, if, if you do get kicked out, if this thing shuts down for whatever reason, come back. Um, or if you leave and want to rejoin uh, later on, just do it the same way you did. Again, Josh, you know, let me know if any, any of that's not true. But uh, again, just as you come on, if you need to come on again, just give us time. Um, to, to get you admitted and all that. So I think, Josh, David, William, is there anything else that I missed before I get going here? I think you're good. Okay. It should all work the way you said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
good deal. Appreciate it. Let me know if y'all, if something gets messed up, you know, uh, feel free to interrupt me. No problem. All right. We'll uh, go ahead and get started. All right. Like I said, I'm going to just give a, a season overview uh, again. Um, just some things I saw, I think hit some highlights um, and just want to pick out a few topics again. Um, you know, it, it was a uh, not a season I don't think most of us want to remember, um, unfortunately. Um, it, it was a heck of a season, uh, I know, for myself to get started um, in, in this position, but, uh, you know, I, I've still enjoyed it very much. Um, so, uh, first, I want to start out with weather. That really was kind of the main driver in a lot of issues, um, and, and that's kind of the theme of, of uh, the things I want to talk about today, but I do want to start out and just look at some weather from last year. And these are two different um, maps here, pretty much both saying the same thing. The left one, um, they're both January to March of 2020. Just want to look at our, our greenhouse season. Um, average temps on the left, minimum on the right, but basically again saying the same thing and just looking at the trend that pretty much the whole East Coast and definitely, um, you know, the flu flu cured belt um, was above average and, and in a lot of cases was record uh, warm temperatures. And again, I think that's pretty much what we saw um, from last year. And I, I again say that to, you know, as we think about, and I came, came on kind of later, um, at least officially started in March, so kind of later in, in the transplant or in uh, the greenhouse season. Um, and again, just kind of wanted to touch on some of those issues. Um, and we, when we think about uh, kind of a mild, warm, you know, winter like we have and, and kind of like what we're supposed to have um, over the next couple of months, we think it really um, big for greenhouse diseases. Um, and Pythium is probably our most common. Um, and again, I, I saw quite a bit of that, got quite a bit of phone calls. Um, directed at that um, and these just some pictures and very early uh, start to that you can see kind of the brown mushy roots here um, some rotting at the soil line there uh, but but again I, uh, I want to point out the weather in this because Pythium um, you know especially when we moved into April um, it was warm that float water gets warmed up, it's sitting there, our, our transplanting was delayed for various reasons. Um, you know, nothing ever works out for weather, um, you know, breaks downs. Um, that water temp heats up and uh, that, that's really uh, creates an ideal uh, living situation for that pathogen. Um, so I think that was a, a lot of cause for some of the issues, again, that we saw in the season um, or in the greenhouse there. Um, and again, this is kind of how, how it starts. Uh, I mean, you know, to me, it looks like uh, you just took a basketball and kind of threw it out in, in, in your bed and it just, uh, those plants just never recover from there. Um, and again, William's gonna kind of go into a little bit more greenhouse management and disease, but I just wanted, again, to, to make these points here. Um, again, the big thing, you know, as we think about damping off can come from two, two different pathogens. Rhizoc, as you see on the outside here, and Pythium, again, is kind of that mushy uh, um, at the soil line there. And then the big thing, if you pick the uh, trays up out of the water and they're brown like that, just mushy roots, and uh, that pathogen is, is water mobile, and that's pretty much a telltale sign of that. Um, something else I saw, um, pretty common, I think I've somewhat every year, common injury from foliar fungicide. Um, you know, you can see the intervenal chlorosis here. Um, typically not a huge issue as long as it's, it's corrected. Um, moving forward, has uh, those plants have a hospital, hospitable environment uh, moving forward. But typically comes from, uh, you know, maybe using too high rate, um, not getting spray coverage is getting concentrated in one area or, um, just not being mixed up very well um, in, in the container. Also, uh, something else somewhat common, not as much as the other uh, this year was some dry cell. Um, and, and I think I know it may be hard to see um, in this picture here, uh, but uh, I think a lot of it comes from 
the media not getting um, filled up all the way, not good. Uh, having some air pockets basically in between the sail to sticking um, to the top. Um, and just having gaps and then it's getting bumped around and, and pushed down and then uh, just not getting filled very much. But typically, um, you know, having a good sprinkler, obviously you don't want any jets, any high pressure throwing the plants and seed media out of the trays, but uh, that can be very, very easily corrected uh, moving forward. Um, as far as transplant season, I think we had a pretty wide window. Um, I know some folks got out very early, early mid-March, um, and then that was kind of went all the way um, towards first and the middle of May in, in some cases, again, for various reasons, a lot of weather um, related problems there. Um, and, and that's kind of what I want to go through um, over these next several slides is really um, just show again, kind of some things I saw and I think they were all uh, very much related to the weather, to the environment and a lot of those circumstances. Again, we see a lot of just delayed growth, um, you know, pesticide applications, injury from that um, early on in the, in the float water or in the transplant water. Um, and it seemed this year, those that, uh, you know, that, that tobacco that was set early, um, at mid-March, early April timeframe, if it got in the ground, it seemed to uh, be able to put on a root system a lot better than that. Um, where, like myself, um, here at the research station, we didn't get, uh, transplanted right there at the end of April, and uh, it kind of turned out to be a disaster in some cases. So again, um, not really advocating for super early, that mid-March transplanting, but I know some of y'all do it and it works very well, um, especially, you know, your larger growers and, and, and spreading out some of that acreage. Um, again, it, it seemed to kind of pay off this year the way it worked out. So again, going back to uh, just some weather data here again kind of same um, same pictures here same uh, maps looking at April to June early transplant season uh, you know we were kind of warm early on in the greenhouse and then uh, April to June it, it was kind of the opposite we never really warmed up um, and then we can see that here uh, again pretty much along the whole east coast uh, where we were definitely below to uh, what they call much below average um, temperature. So again, it's tough in those kind of environments. Um, you know, we, we, well, we gotta go, we gotta go, gotta get the plant out of the greenhouses into the ground. Uh, but if it's not a conducive environment uh, for plant growth, then again, it's, it's just gonna sit there kind of like we saw. Um, and probably even more of an issue again, is I know I'm not telling y'all anything you don't already know, but uh, as we look at rain, Again, April to June, most of that uh, will come in May. They're at the end of May, um, and this map on the right shows that. And pretty much in North Carolina, southeast to uh, the, the whole PD area, basically of South Carolina, was record uh, precipitation. And, and again, we, we definitely felt that around here. So uh, again, looking at one of the weather stations here for rainfall at the PD, and this is just showing March. Uh, to September, um, we were 20 inches above that 30 year average. Um, and again, a lot of that coming from May and then also um, kind of the end of July, first of uh, with the hurricane um, and then a lot in September. And I, you know, even look until now, that would probably uh, be even now, it, it was uh, predicted to be a warmer um, winter months in 2021 and drier. I know we have not seen the drier part of that. Uh, I'm still waiting on it. Uh, but basically, you know, we, I, I don't think the ground ever dried out in a lot of cases starting um, in May. Um, and again, here's some soil temps. Let me back up, sorry. Um, here on the station, again, we, I transplanted uh, here on the station 29th of April. You know, it was warm, it was good conditions. Um, and then that cold front come in and, and it just, man, it, it really messed everything up from there. Um, and I feel like, uh, again, it just, uh, that's pretty much the way the season, that, that set the, set the, the stage for the whole season. Um, again, here, May, towards the end of that uh, big rain, we had 14 uh, plus inches of rain um, in, in, in several fields here, upwards of 20, I know. Um, 
in, in a lot of locations. Um, you know, I feel like moving out of May into June, things started warming up a little bit um, and definitely into July. And, and it was finally the crop here um, in, in this picture. I started feeling good about it. And then it was uh, come into work. I knew it rained um, and then see this. And it was just, uh, you know, I was pretty discouraged after that. Um, I didn't feel like it rained that much. I think it was three or four inches but I swear it just all came in, in a 30 minute time frame and dumped right here in this one spot. Um, but again, I, I know a lot of y'all felt that too um, throughout the whole season. And again, even in September, um, you know, this was at my house and coming down uh, the road, it was just, it, it never let up. And I think uh, again, um, th those are a lot of issues that we saw moving forward and I don't think the ground just ever dried out. So again, just some pictures early on here. Um, saw some cold injury quite a bit, again, from our later planted stuff. It was small um, and it, again, just set in the ground. A lot of weather flecking um, due to cloudy weather. Again, that ozone kind of gets stuck um, at, the, at the soil uh, and doesn't get dissipated. Um, Again, even bigger plants, just a lot of weird stuff that came, um, like I said, from um, any kind of herbicide, uh, fungicide, insecticide injury, which is not uncommon, um, but still, you know, like here's some bigger plants. Um, we see it from either from Spartan or, uh, you know, in, insecticide from um, um, Platinum or Admire, you know, can in the right environments, we can see some injury there like that. or you know, could be just some herbicides, some carryover. Um, but again, um, just a lot of weird stuff. And I, and I, I know it's probably easy to say, um, you know, on, on our end is, is it's all weather related. Um, so, and even worms, I, I, I saw this hornworm. This was uh, obviously you can see the size of that plant, but they'd um, even the past year or two, I've noticed hornworms. They, this was early June, which is a lot earlier than, than, we generally see those, um, again, no, no doubt the crop was behind, but we're dealing with that. Um, I think I saw hornworms earlier um, than I did budworms. Um, so again, just weird season, a little bit later, and this was probably the worst um, really that I saw here. Um, you know, I, I know, again, a lot of y'all dealt with that, got a lot of phone calls and questions about that. Um, situations like this, how do I recover from something like this. I mean, you can see uh, three or four weeks behind already. Um, those bottom leaves are washed out. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know how you come back. I don't think you can from um, a situation like this. Um, again, moving on, pretty much ununiform growth here, as you say, I, it just creates a, a lot of issues um, as far as a management factor, um, you know, spraying. I think we're spraying from worms here, but again, you can see some of these plants um, you know, very small, again, li they've literally been sitting there for two months and some that are pushing a button. Um, you know, again, same thing here, bottom leaves washed out, um, plants that are in full bloom, some that aren't even, wouldn't even go over your boot. And, and again, th those bottom leaves are, are just, uh, you know, burn off and, and not going to do anything from that. Uh, and then, you know, the hurricane come in and, and I don't, uh, it still stayed pretty wet. Again, uh, you know, out of all these pictures, I don't, I don't think there's a dry piece of dirt uh, showing. Um, so this was kind of just the icing on the cake after this came through um, and, and for a lot of folks. Um, so again, um, I really want to just discuss, you know, again, this, this isn't an exhaustive list for the issues that we saw this year, but I, but I really think you know, there's nothing we can do about the weather, and that was just the hand we were dealt, unfortunately, this year. Um, had that delayed plant growth, um, the lack of a root system in a lot of cases, um, and it, you know, the fertilizer was there, uh, more than enough fertilizer, fertilizer was there in a lot of cases, uh, but there was that root system just did not get it um, for the first half of the season. Um, a lot of early flowering, I saw that, you know, knee high plants, flowering out. I think that's just a stress-induced issue there. Again, the non-uniform growth, plant size, um, it, it makes 
you know, spraying anything, especially we get into you know, getting good coverage. That's a very important thing for um, CPA application, um, whatever it is we're doing, especially managing sucker control, and it just puts us constantly behind uh, from the get-go. Um, and one thing I, I definitely want to uh, touch on here is leaching adjustments, obviously, with a lot of the rain. Um, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of phone calls about that. I know we, most of you, probably everyone at least made one leaching adjustment, uh, maybe in, in, in several cases, two, and, and maybe sometimes as many as three. Um, but a lot of that, you know, I, I look back even here on the station and um, I, I probably would have done some things differently because I, I saw a lot of late season uptake um, of that nitrogen. Um, and that, again, that creates a lot of green tops and again, uh, our sucker control was, was not good um, due to those reasons. And that's next couple of sides. Uh, I want to make a few points there. Um, but I want to start in general as we think about um, increasing or uh, excessive nitrogen rates. Um, it doesn't take much for a tobacco crop, as you all know, um, to really um, cause a reduction in yield and quality. As much as uh, 15 pounds over and under um, can really have um, deleterious effects um, of our yield. And again, our, our uh, quality, leaf chemistry, getting the more nitrogen, um, you know, increases our nicotine content, lowers our sugars, and then that's obviously not desirable from an end user standpoint and really creates a harsh um, product. Um, but again, from, from the grower side, maturity, ripening are, are, are delayed, obviously, and then uh, curing green to bike, obviously. Uh, again, you know, y'all know better than I do how, how much of a, a bear that is. Um, again, from pest management, sucker growth, um, like I said, it's just you start out, you're behind before you even get out there and make that first contact application. Um, it's a, it can be extremely aggressive. Um, rank sucker growth. Um, and then with that uh, green uh, immature juvenile tissue there, uh, we see a lot of worm and other insect populations increase because um, they, that, they love that young tissue. Um, and even from a disease standpoint, um, you know, it promotes development of, of some of our um, foliar diseases as well. Um, and then you see in this picture, probably seen this before, a lot of leaf drop. Um, and then that's just lost yield. It, as we increase nitrogen, that plant gets bigger, that leaf gets bigger, but the body um, actually is thinned out. It's basically taking that potential and just stretching it out. Um, it's not, uh, you know, maybe think, oh, bigger leaf, that's what I need, but um, it's kind of counterintuitive there, but it's uh, obviously if it's more weight and then the stalk is, is um, uh, green, um, and it can break off, obviously, and we're losing yield there. So, again, a big point this year was making those leaching adjustments, and I, and I know I got a lot of phone calls. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not a not an easy thing. It's basically an educated guess. You know, I try to make all these scenarios, um, you know, and fit. There's no one-size-fits-all program, and we just try to come up with, with the best, uh, best way to go about it. Um, and one thing I do want to stress, you know, I, for me, definitely making recommendations to you all. Um, I, I'm going to be on a conservative side. I prefer no more than 15 pounds at a time of nitrogen. That 10 to 15 pound range is kind of where I like to stay. Um, our foliar sprays, uh, you know, I always get questions with that, especially later in the season. Um, for making some adjustments, but those foliar sprays are, are not going to compensate. Um, there, there's a very small supply of our nitrogen and potassium um, that come in those sprays, and, and you're going to end up, uh, you know, to, to get enough, it's, it's going to be end up reducing your quality because you're going to end up burning your leaves basically from the salt content or the surfactant load from a lot of those products. Uh, but again, just want to keep in mind, I point all this out, just moving forward, I hope, you know, we don't have a year like we did this past year, but there's a lot of things that go into um, that you need to consider in making those leaching adjustments. And I know y'all have seen um, this table here. It's been around for a long time. Um, 
and it's it's old, uh, but I th it's relevant today as it was um, in the 60s when it was made. But there's a, a again, just to hit the big point, soil type, obviously, are we on a fine textured, a coarse textured soil? Um, you know, that, that's a very important consideration we need to think about. How much water, you know, uh, as far as our, our soils are saturated, um, how much water ran off, how much actually got leached through the soil profile. Uh, again, I, I know I kind of underestimate that. I think a lot of times we think, man, we got 20 inches of rain, it all went through the soil. No, you know, that, that's not the case. Um, a lot of it ran off. Um, how much nitrogen is already there? Um, and I think, you know, that can start a whole nother conversation as far as general uh, nitrogen management from your base fertilizer. Um, and, and that's why I, I prefer to see split applications uh, rather than going out, putting everything out up front or at one time. Um, but um, the crop stage, obviously, um, you know, and, and we had a wide variety uh, for that. Um, a lot of you were, again, very early on and then very late, um, you know, trying to make some of these adjustments. Uh, but obviously that needs to be in consideration. And I think it's important also, again, going by this table here, you know, if we, you go by here, this was made in the 60s and I think it's important as we think about our variety development and the varieties that were used in making um, these recommendations, I think it's good to, come off about whatever uh, percentage, whatever poundage that you uh, come up with that you think you need to adjust. I would back off of that uh, by about 10 or 15% just to account for our new varieties um, that are more efficient, more efficient nitrogen users than, than old varieties from again, the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, I'm running out of time here, I'm talking too much. Um, one thing I did want to, I think it goes along with this season, um, and something I talked about, touched on last year was transplant water fertilizer, and I did begin a study, um, and I got a lot of feedback from some of you all um, about this. Um, so I just want to share very quickly some of those results. So I, we've looked at a couple of different um, products, SQEM 94515, um, Black Label Zinc, Ad Advanced 624.6, I think are probably the most popular products, but also threw in there 11370, which is just a corn starter, which is uh, not recommended um, for the use of this. Um, and then we had an Exceed product in uh, with or without transplant water only. Uh, but we were mostly looking at phosphorus, five and 10 pounds a piece. And, and that's Again, kind of going back to the foliar sprays with, with trying to get either nitrogen or potassium from these, it's not enough to make um, any kind of difference. Um, and phosphorus is important for early development and root growth. Um, so that's really what we were focused on there. Um, but the highlights of that basically, and there was a little bit of difference between these products here, as you can see um, in Vigor, but basically where we had something was better than nothing. That's kind of the big point again, one year of data here, um, but again, I think if, if you think back to, you know, what the early season looked like, it makes a lot of sense. And it was a good year to do a study like this. I know some of y'all took me to the fields and say, look, here's, here's where I had or, uh, something in the set of water, here's where I didn't, and, and you can definitely tell a difference. Um, and, and I can see the difference here. Uh, again, in a good year, you may not see anything, but definitely if it was a year to use it, this was the year for sure. Uh, but again, you can definitely see those differences. Um, but kind of the major point, uh, I guess, that I've, I try to make with these is by the end of the year, you know, that plant's very good at compensating for that. And we did not see a yield difference um, whether using those products or not. Um, so again, as I said last year, I definitely am not saying don't use these products. I'm not saying they're, they're a waste of time by any means. I think they have their place. And again, if you are comfortable using them, you got a product you like and you see a value in that, keep using it uh, for sure. Um, again, I, I think again, where we may not see a yield um, you know, difference, um, I think if, if it can provide a consistent crop, a uniform crop, again, like we saw, um, had a lot of issues with the, just the up and down crop. Um, if, if that uh, transplant water fertilizer application can help with that, 
then obviously it helps with our overall management, as I said before. So again, that's the highlights of that. And, and then of course, you know, there, there, anything you use, there's a level of risk um, with that. Again, the, the more things we start putting in, in a tank um, is where we can get burnt sometimes. So um, I'm gonna jump, weed management, uh, I'm gonna jump through that because I'm running time. Big thing with weed management and y'all, if y'all gonna watch the gap videos, y'all will have a more in depth. Um, I just took some slides from that presentation, but big thing I wanna point out um, stay vigilant, you know, start clean, stay clean. I know y'all heard that in other crops and I want to continue, you will continue to hear me say that um, for, for a variety of reasons, definitely with weed management, pest management in general, but I want to encourage a lay by application. Um, I know we're a lot of years, uh, commodity prices are low. Um, you know, we, we want to cut back on things and I, highly encourage that weed management, pest management in general is not one of those. Um, and on, again, on top of that, use a strong pre. We usually don't have a problem starting off early, starting clean early. It's just getting later into the season uh, is where it kind of starts to break down. Um, there's other, got a lot of other things going on um, as harvest comes, uh, but I, I, I wanna encourage you all to use, uh, I know we don't have many options, but use something at lay by. New varieties, I wanna make sure to point that. A um, couple of new varieties here, 1960, NC 1960. New variety from uh, NC State. Um, it will, I don't, pretty sure it won't be available this year, but for, you should uh, have it for 2022. Um, so I, I don't think they've worked through all the licensing agreement there, um, but it's been in the OVT for a couple of years, very high yielding um, and high black shank. Um, there's limited data on the bacterial wilt, uh, but I think from um, talking uh, with the breeder folks in North Carolina, somewhat similar uh, to 196, maybe a low to moderate resistance, moderate at best. Um, we had it on farm in, in, in the uh, wilt nursery here. Um, and I, I would say the same, um, you know, not definitely not going to be great. Um, but if, if wilt is really what you're looking for, uh, but it looks like a very strong variety. Um, to think about. Gold Leaf's got a couple, GL365 is not new. Um, I, that's been, been around for a couple of years, but I think the, the seed supply has been low, uh, but I think that's a very strong, um, has shown to be a strong uh, a variety with a good disease package as well. So if you're interested in that, I think they're gonna have some uh, limited supply. Uh, again, this year, talk with Paul, Sedona Boy, Gold Leaf, and if you're interested in that, they've got another new variety, GL386, um, and that was just, that is new, just an OVT this past year, um, but I, I, from what I'm hearing with that, it's basically GF318 with mosaic resistance. Um, so again, um, with the 1960, I'll, you know, if you're interested in that, thinking about it for next year, I'll, I'll keep you updated as we learn more how that's going to play out uh, and get with Gold Leaf if, if you're interested in those. Um, I always like to make these points as we talk about new varieties. When trying a new variety, don't plant half your crop, your whole crop in a new variety. All right. We, I've seen, you know, some disasters, some folks get burnt, they, they try something new. Um, and then say, man, I hate this stuff. I don't like it. Um, well, you know, Try, uh, again, depends on how, maybe a barn, a couple of barns at most, five or 10% of your crop, you know, don't, uh, don't put 50% or more of your crop in, don't put 25% of your crop into it. Um, try to try a little bit out, spread it out and, and see if you like it. Um, as we talk about some of these new varieties with these high uh, disease packages, um, that does not mean that you need to cut back on your, uh, uh, pest management programs, your fungicide programs in particular, um, you know, just because you have a highly resistant variety does not mean we can cut back on these other things, as I said before, with their disease and, and uh, some nematodes, I don't think we talk about enough. Um, and, and hopefully I can, I'm not a nematologist, but I will try to uh, provide some of that information moving forward, um, certainly. The OVT data, um, obviously it hadn't been OVT in South Carolina for a couple of years, maybe several years now. That's one of my goals this year is to have at least a limited um, 
OVT here at the PD station, something localized for South Carolina. Um, so hope to have have that for y'all again. I've got the the disease nursery and and all these have been in there. So if you're interested in in some of that performance uh, from Granville Wilt, let me know. Um, if if you're interested in having some of the this is North Carolina's OVT, um, I, I know I can get uh, J. Michael will be glad to provide um, his from Georgia. So um, again, let me know. Let your agents know, and I'll get this passed on to you. Gap training. As you probably know, uh, already know, I know some folks, uh, at least one of the manufacturers, I think we're already signed a contract this week. So they probably told you that will be um, already live. So online or mail in, go online to Gap Connections with your um, grower ID and do all that. We made videos here. So basically you gotta watch some videos um, from us and extension for, um, Still got to watch the gap in the labor, uh, but the good thing is you don't have to do it all at one time. You know, if you watch William's video and say, man, I cannot stand to hear him or anybody else talk again uh, today, come back tomorrow, come back next week and, and keep on as long as it's all done by June 30th. Um, there is a mail-in option. Again, we had to, you have to take quizzes for all this. Again, I, I personally made them, tried to make them as, as easy um, and as painless as possible. Um, so if you've got any major questions with that, I'll be glad to try to answer. If not, get with Gap Connections. Um, Gap Records should be at receiving stations, um, maybe this week or by next week. Um, they were supposed to be shipped from Mullins or to Mullins, um, so they should be there to, if you want, can go by and pick those up if you need them. Um, I will have some here. They're supposed to be shipping me a box or two. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you need that, reach out to me and I can help facilitate that. Um, GAP certification, if, if you, your buyer requires that, uh, I just, I just want to mention that. Again, keep that in, in your mind if you hadn't done that as well. Crop insurance changes, we've got some. I just I wanted to, when I was making this, make sure to point that out. We've got uh, Chris, he's going to talk about some of those big changes. Um, some other things going on uh, again. I'm moving forward with the way we're our winter um, from a management perspective. Supposed to have a, a average warmer once again winter again drier. We haven't seen the drier part, but again, as way well, if you had issues in the greenhouse um, or even in the field, uh, I, I just encourage you to be more proactive rather than reactive with our pest management. Again, especially uh, with sanitation in the greenhouse or you know use uh, use those. Uh, preventative um, fungicide applications in, in uh, rather than trying to uh, um, cure it. So again, some of the, again, I will end with that. Um, I think uh, Dr. Kant Kantrovich will probably discuss some of these economic and outlook issues. Um, so anybody got any questions? Again, thank you all. Appreciate you uh, tuning in. Um, and again, we've got, uh, I'm gonna move it, give it right to William since I probably kind of went over on time a little bit, but again, keep your questions in mind or um, use that chat box, send me a private message or just uh, just put a message on there and, and we can answer that as other speakers are going. So thank you very much. William, you got it? Yeah, I'm getting my screen shot. All right. <clears throat> it's in the, uh, put a two, per there you go. Got it. All right, so. I'm going to be talking about greenhouse disease management for flu cured tobacco. Um, also, at the end, we're going to touch on uh, some greenhouse fertilizer calculations, kind of refresh on those. So, there are several possible greenhouse diseases we might see here in South Carolina, but the top three are the most common. Uh, we'll start off with target spot. And this is the same target spot that you might see later on in the field. 
uh, later on in the growing season in the field, but in the greenhouse, it usually occurs fairly late in the transplant production season when the canopy of the transplants is fully closed and without proper ventilation, you might see some airflow restrictions and moisture retention issues. Uh, and that creates the warm, the perfect warm and moist uh, environment needed for target spot development. Uh, it's usually brought into the greenhouse as a surface contaminant on old reused trays, and it can be blown in from outside of the greenhouse as well. Bear with me. All right. Uh, next is damping off. And this is a general term we use to describe two fairly similar diseases. Uh, Dr. Inman touched on this earlier, but uh, Pythium and Rhizoctonia. In the first, or the upper right hand picture here, we'll see uh, Pythium. And you can see how the roots are, are brown and slimy and sloughing off. And this is our most common greenhouse disease in South Carolina. And it primarily enters the greenhouse in, in our old reuse trays. But it's important to remember that uh, Pythium is a, it's not a true fungus. It's actually a type of water mold. So uh, by definition, it loves the water. And uh, like Dr. Emmons said, it's very mobile in the water. And I'm pretty sure no one's doing it, doing this anymore, but uh, that's why we shouldn't be using surface water or pond water to fill our float beds. Uh, you risk starting behind the eight ball and bringing not only Pythium, but other pathogens into the greenhouse as well. And then next is Rhizoctonia, and this is pretty much the same one mentioned earlier for target spot, but there's actually two different strains um, that we see in float systems. And so one only causes damping off and the other can cause both damping off and target spot. And this can enter the greenhouse in your uh, growing media or as a surface contaminant in your old float trays. In the later stages of uh, disease development, these two look pretty similar, Pythium and Rhizoc, but the main visual difference between these two pathogens uh, in the early stages is that rhizoctonium mainly attacks the lower portion of the stem and pythium would normally affect the roots the most. Uh, next is stem rot. This is another general term we use to describe collar rot and gray mold. Collar rot is the most common of the two and is some kind, sometimes called white mold because of the fuzzy fungal mycelium growth that you can see at the top uh, left picture here. Uh, this also usually occurs usually occurs uh, fairly late in the transplant production season and is commonly blown in from outside of the greenhouse. Uh, gray mold is also known as botrytis. Isn't usually a, a big problem for us here, but it's certainly present in our area. The bottom left picture here shows a uh, straw, an infected strawberry uh, from a field in Horry County. So it's definitely here and it could probably be a problem in the greenhouse under the right conditions. Uh, it can be brought in on infected fruit. It could be blown in from a field or woods nearby. Um, it could also come in by way of surface water. Um, Tobacco mosaic virus or TMV, it's, uh, it's been proven that this can be seed transmitted, but uh, remember TMV is spread by contact. So usually if we have a problem, um, it's likely gonna be because of poor sanitation practices like using tobacco products in the greenhouse and handling transplants without washing your hands. Uh, once an area is infected, it can easily be spread by mowing. Next, the next two here, black shank and bacterial wilt. Um, we're very familiar with these diseases and how bad they can be in the field, but um, using or introducing surface water in our greenhouse is likely the only way that we would see uh, these in a greenhouse. Blue molds is the last one here and knock on wood, 
it hasn't been an issue here in the last several years. Uh, but it usually can't over overwinter here anyway, uh, due to the weather and the need for a living host to survive. But it can certainly be brought in on transplants from other areas when we have a plant shortage or on wind currents, uh, and that's beyond our control. So now that we've talked about some of the most common diseases we might see, uh, we're gonna talk about the keys to healthy transplant production. And the first key is sanitation. We've all heard the, the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and that's what we should be trying to do here. Um, sanitation practices help prevent the introduction and spread of pathogens in our greenhouse. And uh, we know that buying new trays every year isn't cost effective. It's not good for the environment. So in order to reuse our old trays, they have to be sanitized and steaming is definitely the best way to do that. Uh, use of materials like bleach, commercial and industrial cleaners is not recommended. They provide minimal control at best and they're more likely to injure plants than help with disease control. And we've probably all seen the effects of, of chlorine injury on tobacco seedlings. Uh, they're very sensitive to that. And I think the main reason they provide minimal control is because these materials are only sterilizing the surface of the tray, whereas the steam can get into all those cracks and crevices and kill the pathogens that could be embedded in the walls of the tray. Next is uh, the use of sterile peat vermiculite soil, soil mixes. And if we're buying an actual tobacco soil mix, we should be getting just that. Uh, but try not to use bags that are left over from previous years. Uh, year old soil probably isn't sterile anymore and sometimes old soil can dry out and become hydrophobic uh, where they don't wick very well. And we all know that causes issues with uneven plant stands in our greenhouse and sometimes the small viable plants get shaded out also causes mowing issues with different size plants. Um, next is we need to make sure we're cleaning and sterilizing our mowers. And we can do this with a 50% bleach solution. Uh, just make sure you remember to rinse off the mower with fresh water uh, to wash the bleach off and prevent plant injury and the rusting and corrosion, uh, corrosion of your uh, mower. Next, we should make sure we're removing, removing our plant clippings from the vicinity of the greenhouse structure, uh, at least 100 yards away or bury them. Um, Dr. Gooden used to always say, if you could see the greenhouse from where you're dumping these plants, you're not far enough away. Um, promote good drainage, good drainage and dry walkways, no standing water, no use of tobacco products in the greenhouse. Workers should wash hands with abrasive soap prior to handling transplants and trays. And it's a good idea to clean your shoes. This is something that I never really thought about uh, before reading an article a while back, but you can track in all kinds of things on, uh, on your shoes, stepping in a mud puddle or uh, bringing soil in uh, from outside the greenhouse. And the last sanitation practice here is greenhouse solarization and this is something that's not talked about a whole lot. It's uh, really the last thing on our minds and we're trying, uh, last thing on our minds when we're trying to make that transition to the field. But it's always a good idea to seal up those greenhouses tight and uh, leave them for a few weeks and let the temperatures rise and kill any pathogens that might be hanging around. The next key for healthy transplant production is providing proper ventilation. And we do this by using the side curtains and fans to promote horizontal airflow. Uh, proper ventilation removes stagnant air and reduces humidity and results in a reduction in the potential for leaf diseases like target spot, blue mold and gray mold. Uh, so lowering those side curtains when we can on warm sunny days 
helps to dry out the transplants uh, and remove uh, any excess moisture. And that makes the plants less susceptible to disease. And I also wanted to mention that the horizontal airflow system that we're talking about here is the fans on the inside of the greenhouse and not necessarily the exhaust fans. Um, this system was developed by a University of Florida researcher in the 70s. And so most of our tobacco greenhouses that were built later on uh, already have that system in place. But we need to make sure we're maintaining it and keeping it in good operating conditions. Next key here uh, for healthy transplant production is sound, pro sound production practices. And the first thing on my list here is ensuring that our water source is clean and that wa water quality parameters are acceptable. Uh, water quality can be a really big issue, especially in the coastal counties of South Carolina which also happens to be where the majority of our tobacco production is. Um, I see water quality issues all the time and it seems like the deeper the well, the worse the water quality gets to a certain extent. And we're seeing some signs of salt water intrusion, which can include high levels of all these things, pH, alkalinity, uh, sodium chloride, sodium absorption ratio or SAR and electrical conductivity or EC. Uh, most of these can be uh, fairly easily corrected, but sometimes uh, we recommend switching to a, a shallow well. And if, well, switching to a shallow well if you have one on the property. And sometimes uh, people may end up drilling a new well, but that's not a guaranteed fix either. And it's often more cost effective to just use municipal water. Uh, but we need to make sure we test that water as well. Uh, municipal water can have pretty high concentrations of chlorine uh, build up at the end of the lines, especially. And so those that uh, have their greenhouses a little closer to the water plant usually have less issues with that, but that's something to keep in mind. So Clemson has a special tobacco float water test um, that includes recommendations on how to correct some of those issues by adding a specific amount of battery acid or gypsum. The sample fee is $25, but that's a very small price to pay for healthy transplants. Uh, I was helping a grower a couple years, a couple years ago that was having issues in his greenhouse and uh, we sent water samples off and he ended up having a pH in the low fours, which was low enough to cause some iron toxicity issues and the roots kind of looked like they had been pruned or burned off with Terra Master. Um, but come to find out the grower added the same amount of battery acid that his neighbor did instead of basing it on the test results from his own well. And uh, another thing is we don't need to assume that water sample results will be the same from year to year. Water never stops moving, whether it's above ground or below ground. So we should be getting a sample of our source water every year. And it's not a bad idea to get a couple samples during the transplant production season of your float water to make sure you're on the right track. Here are a few more uh, key production practices to consider. Don't over fertilize as this makes plants susceptible to disease. Avoid extreme greenhouse temperatures. Uh, this stresses your plants, increases susceptibility to disease and promotes fertilizer salts injury. Do not heat the float water. Tobacco seedlings can grow in a float system with very cold water. Low float water temperatures reduce the spread of pythium and heating float water may increase pythium seedling disease. We need to make sure we're clipping our plants early and often and in three to five day intervals. Uh, clipping increases the number of usable plants. Uh, it helps with stem length uniformity um, and stem diameter. And we should start clipping when the plant is about two to two and a half inches above the tray. And we want to make sure we're clipping one to one and a half inches above the bud. This helps increase light penetration. 
and air circulation throughout the canopy. And that also helps uh, with disease control. Uh, it also produces a short stocky plant that makes a smoother transition to the field instead of waving around and taking a beating as a overgrown plant. And the last thing I want to talk about here is an excessive amount of clipping means we started too early. So if, if you're clipping these plants more than 12 to 15 times, we probably need to take a step back and talk about why. Uh, I understand the need to be precautious and, and get an early start in case something happens, but every time we run that mower over those plants, we risk uh, spreading disease, and we're also wasting a lot of money on LP gas, uh, heating a greenhouse in the coldest part of the winter, and then sometimes end up having to take a, a oversized leggy plant to the field anyway if, uh, transplant, if transplanting is uh, held up by the weather or whatever else. Uh, so we should try to plan on starting a little later to avoid uh, excessive amounts of clipping. The last key for healthy transplant production is uh, monitoring. Most people don't have a problem with this. They treat their greenhouse like their baby, but we need to be checking on it multiple, multiple times a day because things can get out of hand really quick in a controlled environment like that if something goes wrong. Um, frequently wielded or yellow plants indicate uh, that disease is becoming established. And if you look here where the arrow is pointing on the picture on the left, you'll notice a small circular area that looks kind of beat down like somebody stepped in it or like Dr. Emmons said earlier, you threw a basketball in it. And that's what pythium is usually gonna look like uh, when it's first getting started. And the picture on the right is what it looks like up close, but it's very inconspicuous and in a large greenhouse with a bunch of plants, uh, it's easy to miss something like that. But we need to make sure we're promptly removing any trays with diseased plants from the vicinity of the greenhouse and destroy them along with the clippings. So now that we've talked about all the cultural practices we can use to prevent disease, uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk briefly about our chemical control options. Uh, and I do mean briefly since there's just not a lot of labeled products to talk about. And with that being said, we should make sure we're following the label to a T and doing our, doing our part to prevent resistance to these products. Uh, because the tobacco industry is such a small market compared to other crops, um, and the cost, the high cost of, of running those tests with the EPA registration, uh, the chances of, of us getting any new chemistries labeled for tobacco is uh, pretty slim. So we definitely need to protect what we have. If for target spot and blue, blue mold, our main go-to product is Quadris. And when we use Quadris, we need to make sure we're spraying only if leaves are quarter sized or bigger. We need to spray directly over the top of the trays and spray for complete tray coverage, especially when we have a thick canopy. Uh, we need to apply enough for runoff to get directly to the stem. And to do this, they recommend five gallons uh, of spray volume per thousand square foot. Do not get quadrus into the water. Do not spray into an open bay. And remember that only one application is allowed in the greenhouse prior to transplanting. And if we end up having a spray for target spot in the field later on, make sure we include this greenhouse application into our maximum annual rate. And I wanna briefly mention Manzate Pro Stick. Uh, it can be used in the field or the greenhouse, uh, even though it's not commonly used. Um, we do have a 24C label for it in South Carolina. You can begin application uh, before symptoms develop as early as dime-sized plants, and then continue on a seven-day schedule since it doesn't have uh, systemic activity in the plant. Uh, there's very little risk for the, uh, for the chance of uh, fungal pathogens developing resistance. And I think there's two reasons, it's, two reasons it's not used that often. 
uh, with the first being that tobacco companies express concerns over uh, residue levels of the dithiocarbamates or the M3 fungicides. Um, I wouldn't think that greenhouse applications would cause an issue with residue that early on in the life of the plant, uh, but it's best to talk to your buyer before making an application. And the second reason it's not used that often is the risk of phytotoxicity or seedling injury. According to the University of Kentucky, uh, the risk of injury varies from season to season and from seed lot to seed lot. So, and injury seems to be worse on, or worse on heavily fertilized succulent plants uh, and when the weather is hot and humid. So it's probably best we avoid this product if we can, but be very cautious if you do decide to use it. Then we have Terramaster fungicide, which is used for Pythium root rot in the greenhouse. It can be used as a preventative or a curative treatment. Um, it must be used in the float water. If you spray it over the top of the plants, it, it will kill or severely injure them. Uh, some specific label instructions for a preventative, for preventative treatment includes uh, do not apply Terramaster 4EC until the roots enter the water, which is usually two to three weeks after seeding, or when leaves are greater than one inch in diameter. Then after that, up to one ounce per 100 gallons uh, application can be made every three weeks, but do not exceed a maximum rate of 3.8 ounces per season. 3.8 ounces per 100 gallons per season. Do not apply any later than eight weeks after seeding, uh, since TerraMaster is known for burning or pruning those roots. Uh, and this helps us make sure we're leaving enough time to cut some new roots before heading to the field. Uh, making an application too late kind of defeats the purpose anyway, since the plants uh, would have to stay in the greenhouse environment uh, that much longer, and in, which increases the risk for being infected with other diseases. And as always, read and follow the label when you're using any of these products. I didn't mention ActiGuard or Admire Pro in the chemical control section since the I consider tomato spotted wilt to be more of a field disease. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna go over some greenhouse float water uh, fertilizer calculations really quick. A better nutrient management means all around more healthy plants that are less susceptible to disease and other stresses. seven days after seeding. It doesn't do any good to fertilize before seeding uh, since there are no roots to take up the fertilizer at that point. And then the new roots that do come later on are really young and tender and susceptible to fertilizer soft injury. So that's why we recommend starting with a low nitrogen concentration of around 100 parts per million and then coming back around four weeks later and adding another 150 parts per million. So that's, in order to do that, we're gonna use this equation here. It's the desired concentration in parts per million divided by percent nutrient concentration in fertilizer times 0 0.75. And if we do that, that gives us the amount of fertilizer in ounces that we should be adding per 100 gallons of water. So for this example, we're going to say we want to do 150 parts per million. And we're going to be using 16, 16, 5, 16 fertilizer. And remember, this is N, P, and K. So, and we're looking at nitrogen. So we're going to use 16 for this next number. So 150 over just the number 16, not 16%. 16 and then we're going to multiply that by 0 0.75. And 0 0.75 is a constant in this equation. 
it doesn't change regardless of uh, our desired concentration. So we're always going to use 0 0.75. And if we do that, we're going to, it's going to equal 12.5 ounces per 100 gallons of water. All right, so that's fine, but how, how many 100 gallons of water do we have? So in order to find that out, we need to look at the volume of our float bed. So volume, if you remember, equals length times width times height, or in this case, we're gonna say depth. And the secret to this equation is making sure it's all in the same units. So we want to find cubic feet. So we're gonna use feet for all of our dimensions. Mm -hmm. So 50 feet long times 20 feet wide times six inches deep is what we said, but we need to convert that to feet by, by 12. So that equals a half a foot times 0.5. If we do that, it's going to equal 500 cubic feet in our float bed. And another number that we need to stow away in our brain um, is how many gallons of water are in one cubic foot of space. And that number is 7.4 ounce, 7.48 gallons. So we're gonna say 500 times 7.48 equals 3,740 gallons of water in our float bed. So that's fine, but our formula up here tells us how much to add per 100 gallons. So in order to do that, we're gonna take 37, 40 and divide by 100. That's going to equal 37.4 hundreds of gallons of water in our float bed. And then we're going to take that number and multiply it by the number we came up with up here 12.5 ounces per 100 gallons and that's going to give us our total amount of fertilizer that we need in our float bed and that number is 467.5 ounces and then to convert that to pounds this is in a, in a pound so we're going to divide by 16 which equals 20 9.2 pounds of fertilizer. All right, so I want to thank everyone uh, here for their participation today. And I know it's not like a in-person meeting, but uh, and being able to talk and fellowship with each other, but I hope you get something something uh, from today's meeting and we'll look forward to hopefully a, a normal meeting next year. Uh, this is my cell phone number and email address. And as always, if you need anything, give me a call. And for anyone that would like to be added to my mass text messaging service, all you have to do is text the word ag to 843-612-8578. Uh, I try not to overuse it, but everyone constantly checks their phones and it's definitely a good way to share pertinent information during the growing season and inform you about our programs. Um, next up, I think we have Dr. J. Michael Moore. Uh, he's the extension tobacco agronomist for University of Georgia. He's no stranger here and we thank a lot of him and appreciate all he's done to help South Carolina growers over the last several years. So unless anyone has any questions, I'll turn it over to you, Jay Michael. Okay, thank you, William. Let's see if we can get this um, screen shared. I 
I need to be uh, enabled as a in order to share. Oh this. yeah, sorry about uh, Josh. Can you make Jay Michael a co-host, please? I think he's the only one that can do it. In the meantime, let me say how um, honored I am to be included on this program. And um, I think you already see that you have some top notch folks leading your educational effort in tobacco in, in uh, South Carolina. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased with the presentations and the work that they continue to do uh, with and for you. All right, Jay Michael, you should be co-host now. I got you. Okay, is everybody good with that? Looks good here. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you about two or three things that I saw this past season. I've been seeing my whole career in some, some cases. And uh, the more you see these things over time, you begin to think about them and put pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so the first one we're gonna talk about is the question of uh, what exactly is causing this plant to be so strappy, such narrow leaves and such a rosetted, uh, close spaced uh, leaf um, spacing. Um, is it um, the old Frenching, which is the go-to uh, for this kind of problem, or can it be a nutrient deficiency like manganese deficiency? Uh, or can it be both? And can we solve some of these problems just by um, making nutrient applications? So first of all, remember that Frenching is a yellowing of uh, intervenal tissue. It's a, it's a plant, uh, not necessarily a disease, but a, a plant issue. The veins remain dark green. They have slender leaves with tips curled downward. Um, strappy leaves is what I normally refer to it and has many developing sucker buds that give rise to a rosette appearance, very stacked inner nodes. This is a uh, reference picture in the RJ Reynolds manual. It's also on the uh, tobacco images site at uh, University of Georgia. It's typical of what's been referred to as Frenching. So Frenching uh, can be produced by a bacteria uh, commonly found in the soil. The bacteria secretes a toxin in the soil and it's absorbed by the tobacco roots. Frequently, um, this is observed uh, according to Fernie Todd's book, in a particularly wet area in the field, poorly drained, poorly ventilated, uh, rather warm soils of neutral to alkaline pH, that's approaching seven, um, and low in available nitrogen. So even back in Fernie's day, um, this was typical for Frenching. Um, Here's another picture from the file of what Frenching is referred to and Frenching might look like. This is called um, webbing of the leaf. It's chlorotic tissue between the veins. The veins stay dark green. But I've seen this in some situations where it wasn't very uh, wet. I've seen this in situations behind vegetable crops that were grown on plastic and had had excessive amounts of um, limestone added or gypsum added to those areas. So it made me wonder, what exactly are we looking at? And when I got uh, four calls during the spring of 2020 to go and visit tobacco that had yellowing and uh, narrow leaves in limited areas of the fields, I really started thinking back to what I'd seen over the years. These were all sandy loam soils and it turns out sampling that I did uh, indicated that the soil pHs were all above 6.0. So this was the first one one afternoon. I uh, just happened to be in the area and the grower told me about an area in his field he had concerns about. He wasn't really sure what he was looking at, but it was very obvious as soon as I drove into the field. As I walked it, I began to see more and more plants that were strappy, had very uh, tight 
leaf internodes, very rosetted, and began to sucker profusely. Sucker profusely is something you want to remember. The next morning, I looked at another one of these, and this happened to be behind where onion seedlings were grown in beds. Again, I think that they were limed excessively uh, to make sure that there was enough calcium for these uh, seedlings to grow. And this was spotty all over the field. Um, this was a little bit more widespread, but it um, was uniform across the field that it was uh, splotchy, splotchy. So is this really Frenching or is this a micronutrient problem? And I, I was happy that we were able to take samples, soil samples and tissue samples in this location. This doesn't really look the same as the, the strappy leaves, the narrow leaves that we have been seeing for Frenching. We did have rosetting uh, of the bud. We did have chlorosis of the leaf. We took soil samples and here's one of them. Came back with a pH of 6.6. .6. The manganese level in the soil at 14 is still at a level that might have been adequate under the best weather conditions. But when we had excessive rainfall and cool temperatures, uh, these roots probably were not growing as they would should have and couldn't take up any manganese that was there. But at 6.6, .6, the manganese was very limited in availability because of oxidation and conversion to an unavailable form. In the tissue, we found 21, and 21 is just over the bottom sufficiency level for manganese in tobacco tissue. So um, that led me to believe that this was not necessarily Frenching but a nutrient deficiency. If you look at a chart of uh, various nutrients and their availability over various pH levels, at 6.0, and look down to the star row or line, manganese really begins to become less available. 6.0, 6.3, 6.5, certainly seven manganese is less and less available. Manganese is not needed in tobacco in very large supplies, but it is needed to some degree. And if it's not available, then the plant's going to suffer. Another uh, location, uh, just a day or two later, the grower told me I don't have a good soil sample on, um, in, on a grid in this field, but I got one sample. I think it was 7.0 was the pH. And I said, well, it, seems that we're seeing some of this this year. I'll look at it this afternoon. And by that time, the county agent had soil samples and tissue samples, and we sent those off. Again, rosetting, uh, narrow leaves, chlorosis of the leaf tissue um, to varying degrees, and sometimes right side by side. Again, soil samples uh, running 6.3 for pH and 6.5, very low, uh, manganese in the soil to start with. And then we looked at tissue samples and the tissue samples came back being uh, deficient at uh, 11 and I believe that's uh, 21. I can't see it from my screen. But low and in the tissue. So even though sometimes we have manganese sufficient in the soil because of an insufficient root system and, and poor environmental conditions, we may not be able to get that manganese into the plant in adequate supply to provide adequate growth. And this was the fourth location that I saw a little bit later. A uh, little larger tobacco later in the season, obviously something changed uh, from the time that tobacco started growing and produced those nice lower leaves that look smooth and round and, and clean like they're supposed to be to the buds that now become, uh, well, they look Frenching, don't they? Yeah, I would, I would dare say that these are probably not necessarily Frenching, but again, uh, the root system grew into an area, I think, of higher pH, uh, lower manganese. And I saw this in that field, and that reminded me of something I'd seen 40 years ago and seen described in a number of different uh, publications for manganese deficiency, where the uh, leaf tissue falls out between the veins as the veins continue to be green 
Uh, it starts with flecking, like you see on the bottom leaves, and traces that uh, area along the stem and midrib uh, areas. That will eventually fall out. Don't often see this, but occasionally you do, and I remembered seeing it before. So I found that the manganese actually is involved in the synthesis of chlorophyll and that a deficiency leads to chlorosis in the intervenal tissue of the leaves. The veins remain dark green even when the chlorotic parts of the plant die. Well, that sounds a lot like what we've been talking about for Frenching, doesn't it? This is a picture from the RJ Reynolds uh, Blue Cured Manual and again on our website. Notice the flecking up between the leaf veins. Um, this tissue will uh, eventually, the flecking will coalesce and fall out and leave what I call a fishbone appearance of green veins. The description in the, the Reynolds uh, Flu Cure Tobacco Field Manual uh, is uh, here. Again, it talks about pH greater than 6.2. Uh, it's any time that we're approaching um, 7, any time we've left 6.0, Anytime we're in fields where manganese is in uh, low supply to start with, like we would have in very sandy, sandy loam soils. We start with flecking, looks like weather fleck in a lot of cases, and you do get a yellowing of the bottom part of the plant in some cases, just like you would see with uh, weather fleck or perhaps a little bit of drowning taking place. It does become ragged and uh, you see this fishbone appearance. Uh, later growth appears no normal, but can also have flecking, depending on how the roots develop. So manganese is less available in soils that are above pH 6, and, but it can be very available in soils that are below pH 6. Think of the Burley area and some of their soils where they naturally have high manganese levels and talk about plant toxicity more than they do uh, plant deficiency of manganese. In our soils, it doesn't do a lot of good to put manganese on if our pH is up because it's not available to the plant roots as quickly as it would be if we put it on the tissue. So uh, anytime that we're seeing soils approaching pH of seven uh, in our soils, um, there's just not very much available through the root system. We get much better uptake and usefulness from using it in the, uh, in, as a foliar application. We used two different uh, approaches. We looked at a chelated manganese, um, a little more expensive product. Um, we also looked at the typical manganese sulfate product like Tech Mangum, and um, it's a little more uh, economical. You use a little bit more. And we looked at multiple foliar applications on something like a weekly basis. Our growers were generally very pleased with the response. This happens to be uh, the first field I looked at. Remember, profuse suckering. And we did see a lot of suckering take place. Um, we um, saw that uh, the plant began to recover after application, but um, we did not um, have an idea that we were going to be able to produce a, a full grown crop out of it, but we kept making applications. So this is what that crop looked like later in the season. Um, you can look down in there, you see sucker uh, still, even though the workers had come through and tried to remove those essentially ground suckers and leave one stalk, this was not uh, suitable. It was hard to harvest and didn't produce a great crop. But had we reached that field earlier, we might have been able to actually um, do something that was, was worthwhile. And so this is the uh, last field that I had been called to. Um, I uh, saw it later in the season. It had recovered very well but the grower and his son had made uh, several applications of manganese on a weekly basis, and they were very, very pleased with the outcome. So uh, in 2020, Georgia uh, locations that were generally low in manganese and greater in pH were observed. 
We've got improved growth um, with foliar application of manganese. In the future, it's probably a great idea to take both soil and tissue samples whenever we initially see these problems and determine what our situation is. But based on what I've seen this year, I'm going to be pretty quick to recommend uh, application of manganese because it is so cheap and it, we do get such uh, rapid turnaround uh, as we spoon feed these plants the needed manganese. It may or may not be man, uh, Frenching. <clears throat> so generally though, I agree with statements made earlier. We need to soil, soil sample routinely, keep the pH below six, apply dolomitic limestone only as recommended. Um, don't get that pH too high. Uh, make sure that we have good drainage. Some years that's harder than others. Provide all the conditions that we can to support good root growth with aeration of the root system, anything that we can help that root system um, be more healthy. We will provide adequate nitrogen fertilization and respond immediately to visual symptoms of frenching um, with tissue sampling and soil sampling. Um, if you've seen yellowing in a field, particularly if you've had soybeans in that field and you have a spot where lime was dumped, uh, lime was not spread uniformly, uh, you have poor drainage, uh, you should be suspicious when you come into that field with tobacco. So I think we've learned some things here. I certainly am gonna take a different look at Frenching uh, in the future and wonder if I haven't seen just manganese deficiency. I'll leave that now and uh, go to another topic. Again, the observations made during the 2020 season. Again, um, call to farms that um, we were seeing burning of the lower leaves, modeling of the upper leaf, and this was a tobacco mosaic virus, the virus that we all really knew about before tomato spider wilt virus came along and took over. Williams already said tobacco mosaic virus is transferred um, mechanically from plant to plant or from worker or mower to the plant. I think um, you, we have to be very sensitive to this issue in the greenhouse and it calls for sanitation, 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 always remembering that we don't need to take um, tobacco mosaic virus to the plants um, as we go into the greenhouse. So that's the uh, typical plant that we were seeing in the field and the, and the issue was that um, we saw it on three farms in three different counties coming out of three different greenhouse operations and there were three varieties involved that uh, repeated in multiple locations. These were generally the last plants from the greenhouse going to the field. So these growers were running a little late in transplanting. Um, the greenhouse grower was um, holding these plants probably, trying to keep them from being a little bit overgrown as the temperatures had gotten warmer by that time. And uh, perhaps they received additional clippings and um, they may have been clipped lower than optimum. We did verify our, our um, observations with Agdia tobacco mosaic virus test kits in the field. Again, sanitation is the key. Don't bring it in on uh, workers or don't let visitors come in and reach down and touch plants. Wash your hands. All, everybody ought to be washing their hands with a strong soap before working in the greenhouse, just in case they do touch plants. And we need to sanitize these mowers. Uh, I did work uh, 40 years ago, again, as we were clipping in the beds with a 10% bleach solution and a brush. And if you can remove the gum and, and coloration of the, the, uh, the plant uh, juice from the mower, you can remove the tobacco mosaic virus. Um, and that ought to be done routinely after every clipping, just to be sure. The problem, the problem that we were seeing in our, in our fields was that this wasn't the old fashioned every other plant uh, that was, had mosaic like we saw when we had two droppers to the row. But in case, many cases, we could see that this was um, more damaging 
and it was a result of uh, runs so that you saw entire rows of plants or long areas within the same row. Every plant had tobacco mosaic virus and you could already see it even at this early stage of plants with lower leaves burning and going away, obviously costing you. And in historical data, um, tobacco mosaic virus is a disease that particularly in periods of drought can really cost you um, yield and grade uh, in production of a tobacco crop. It's also important to remember that once you uh, disc those stalks down and um, carry that last load of tobacco to the field, to the uh, receiving station, you're not finished with tobacco mosaic virus because the virus remains in the stalks and the roots until they are completely rotted and gone away. If you can find roots and stalks, you can probably assume that there's tobacco mosaic virus in that field. Rotation is the key and um, many times it takes uh, two years or even more for these stalks and roots to completely rot out before you can be sure to go back to a field uh, that won't have tobacco mosaic virus coming to the new plants from those rotting roots and stalks. And uh, last, I'd like to uh, just talk about a topic that uh, Dr. Bertrand I retired uh, plant pathologist, worked with several county agents on. Uh, it's following up on observations that we've made here in Georgia as we work with growers who have selected the use of uh, 2310 as a very early maturing variety that they they can plant uh, a portion of their crop to and be assured that they can run it through the barns early to the point of having perhaps two thirds of the crop already in the curing barn before they start harvesting the normal uh, commercial varieties, therefore uh, allowing them to have better use of their barns later in the season. Um, this work was used for a poster which won first place in, in the state county agent uh, contest and um, a presentation at the Tobacco Workers Conference by the county agents. So again, based on larger growers that have shown interest um, in PVH 2310 because it produces good yield and grade and ripens early, potentially allowing better use of barns. But there's some problems with this. Um, one of the problems is that PVH 2310 often has more tomato spider wilt virus than any other variety that we're growing. This goes back to 2018, where we put together uh, a number of varieties that had virus resistance to other viruses other than tomato spotted wilt virus, hoping that there was some cross um, resistance that was taking place. These did not have ActiGuard or Admire in the greenhouse or in the field. And um, it does appear that there are some differences in susceptibility um, to tomato spotted wilt virus. With 2310, um, that most desirable variety because of its early maturing nature, having the most tomato spotted wilt virus. The other varieties here are not generally grown to any great degree in Georgia, except for 1600. We do consider 1600 um, a moderate resistance to uh, black shank but um, that doesn't really serve the purpose. If we have black shank, we would not recommend 1600, uh, even with chemical controls, but we do have a good amount of 1600 being grown in the state. In this case, there was no 196 or 326 uh, grown for comparison, so we can't know if uh, 2310 is more susceptible or if P PVH 2254, for instance, is more resistant. Our thinking and the thinking of most in the industry is there is not resistance available in our commercial varieties. However, in 2019, Dr. Bertrand did some work where he compared 2310 and 196, both with ActiGuard and Admire on uh, eight, two locations on the same farm. And he found that um, he got more tomato spotted wilt virus with uh, PVH 2310, even after treatment than you did with 196. 
tremendous, a significantly greater amount. There were no untreated plants here either, so we can't know if, it was, if PVH 2310 is more susceptible or has a lower response to a treatment. So in 2020, we had six uh, farm trials that were set out to resolve this issue. The four treatments were 2310, untreated 2310 with ActiGuard and Admire, 196 untreated and 196 with ActiGuard and Admire in the greenhouse. And all of those um, ActiGuard and my applications were made at the same location, the same day, by the same person. So the results of the data, again, for six trials are, are what you see here. There are some differences in the, what we consider the untreated check and the admire ActiGuard treated for 2310 and 196. It's actually a little bit easier to see that uh, if we go to this chart here, where you can see the progression of uh, tomato spider wilt virus in the field over time. This is weeks. And the yellow curve at the far right hand corner is 2310. That's untreated. So you had the highest amount of tomato spider wilt with it. Next was 196 that was untreated. But we've got positive responses with, for control with Admire and ActiGuard applications for both 2310 and 196, but 2310 always having greater tomato spotted wilt virus than uh, 196. Here's what it looked like in the field early in the season in one, one of those tests. Um, the ActiGuard does tend to cause the plants on the far left and the far right to be a little slower growing, taking off in the field. The um, untreated plants grow fine, they just have a lot of tomato spider wilt virus showing up in them. And so that gives you really a, a false perception of total uh, outcome when you see all that green foliage going down the center two rows for untreated. So in conclusion, uh, 2310 is more susceptible to tomato spider wilt virus than 196 or most of our other commercial uh, varieties. The response to treatment for the two varieties uh, generally is equal. When we applied ActiGuard and Admire, we were able to reduce tomato spider wilt virus in both of these varieties um, in a comparable way. Growers need to be aware of the greater likelihood of tomato spider wilt virus with 2310. And while there's no source of spotted wilt resistance, breeders need to be aware that there are sources of increased susceptibility and be careful um, about this as they provide us uh, new varieties in the future. Spotted wilt control with uh, ActiGuard and Admire varied among locations. This is a little bit of a extra here um, in showing you that um, the percent spotted wilt control for each of these two varieties. This is percent control now um, at all of these six locations. It jumps around, it varies as to how much we got. We got 46 and a half at one location and it drops down to, to 10 at another 10% improvement in control in that particular location. Um, with 196, we had variability as well from a high of 43 to a low of 6.9%. So again, all these plants were uh, from the same location, treated the same greenhouse on the same day. Generally, Dr. Bertrand had, in summarizing 266 trials over the years, found that uh, in untreated, he'd have 27.9% tomato spotted wilt virus, but that with uh, Admire and ActiGuard, he could control tomato spider wilt virus 46% from the worst case scenario, from an untreated. So that's basically our, our, what we're going with and the reason we recommend ActiGuard and Admire for those growers who have used it and are accustomed to handling ActiGuard in the greenhouse and in the field. So um, here's a 
again, a look at the percent spotted wilt for uh, control for these various locations. Again, it varies. In conclusion, overall, this wasn't very good um, control with only 36% in 2310 and 196 only 33%. We, we normally would expect higher control uh, in both of them. So I appreciate the chance to be with you today. Uh, again, I'm very pleased with the program that's being provided for you. Uh, you've got a, a head start on your GAP uh, training because I've included uh, most of these videos in the videos that I put up as well. So you might breeze right through them and having seen them a second time, I know you'll make a hundred on the quiz. I want to thank uh, Dr. Inman for inviting me today, and um, I'll be glad to answer any questions along the way as well. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jay Michael. Uh, again, like William said, I can't imagine having a South Carolina meeting without you being involved. Been a great resource to us and to me personally as well. Um, so again, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move right along here. Dr. Francis Ray Jones is up next. And we're going to hear from him about insect management. As we're waiting, we're having uh, probably some lag here. Uh, again, the, the chat box is a good option. Again, we should have time at the end for questions. Um, looks like he just got kicked off. Um, so utilize that. Again, we can answer those uh, over there. I know there's several of you coming in, uh, joining on the phone. I appreciate that as well. Um, but again, if you got any questions, follow up maybe at the end. We have time or definitely reach out to us uh, at any time. But again, those on a computer, uh, utilize that chat box if you can. And we'll uh, give Francis a minute to get cranked back up here, wherever he got to. He just got kicked off. Josh, can you see if he's trying to join back or I don't, or has he asked yet? I, I'm looking, I'm not getting any messages from. Okay. So he may have had probably some internet issues. Yeah, I don't even see him anywhere. All right, we'll, uh, unless he hops on to the next very short minute. Uh, Dr. Kantrovich, are you, sorry to throw this out, are you ready to go? We'll go ahead and put you on and if, uh, see if Francis comes back and he can go after. Um, yeah, I can go if you uh, want me to start now or do you want to give uh, him another moment or two? Let's, uh, I guess, uh, Start sharing. If he if he pops on here, we'll uh, we'll back up a minute. But go ahead, and that way we're a little bit uh, behind as it is. We'll go ahead and get started. All right, that works for me. All right, we can do that. Let me, let me see if I can get this sharing. I want to thank you for everybody me here again. Most of you uh, have seen me in the past, and. Um, you very well know that I don't like standing behind the podium. My wife actually asked me this morning whether or not she wanted to tie me down to the chair so I wouldn't move and leave, leave this spot. Um, we're gonna, we've got a lot to really cover today. And so let's see here, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Got 
Good on our end. You're able to see it? Yes, sir. All right, good. So we're going to talk uh, um, about a, a number of things uh, real briefly, ag labor, some trade issues, uh, tobacco production, uh, global demand. So, uh, we've got some summary points. I'm going to talk briefly about some farm stress. I do want to say thank you to Dr. Blake Brown. Um, he's allowed me to use some of his slides. He's got some access to some databases that uh, North Carolina State's library uh, pays for, and unfortunately, we don't have the budget to cover. Um, I don't have a lot of time here to talk about everything that's needed, and so I'm going to do my best to fly through this as normal, so please listen slowly. Uh, many of the charts in the presentation that I developed came from data from uh, NAS and the Global Trade System. So I'm going to start off very similar to what I have in previous years. You know, what do you want me to say? No problems, everything's great. Well, keep dreaming, right? However, there are some variables that may provide some hope. And so I, I'm a little bit more optimistic this year than I was last year. However, we need to be aware and understand that, um, you know, all the stars have to align. And so we'll have to see what ends up happening. Now, I will give everybody this. All right, I've, I had this in animal, this image of this animal here last year. Uh, for those that are also watching, you can see my video. Um, if you can figure out and you email me what that is, I will send out of my own money, I will send you one of these wonderful little Clemson squeezy tractors, okay? So let's go ahead and, and start, start moving along. One, we do need to do a little bit better at planning. Uh, look and review financials, do some analysis, um, run some scenarios to see uh, by changing up varieties, uh, modifying what I'm spending, how much I'm spending, where uh, is it going to affect my yields, et cetera, and take a look to see what those things look like, determine if there's any other risk management strategies out there that can be improved. We may need to get out of our comfort zone. Look to the future, all right, regardless of what it may look like. Um, I will say that there was a bill that was signed by the president, I believe it was on December 27th. It did make some changes and additions for things like PPP, some tax credits, um, changes with dealing with net operating loss. So please either contact me or your tax specialist when dealing with that. Now let's look at some of the gritty details. <clears throat> Labor. Labor's not getting any easier, all right? Domestic labor is continuing to be difficult to find and keep. H2A continues to increase in its use. Uh, obviously, this comes with cost. Rising AWERS, uh, for those that utilize H2A, uh, we were hopeful that there was going to be a freeze and some changes that were made. Um, however, uh, these things have moved to the courts and we're dealing with some of these issues now at the national level. Uh, there's also issues with some of the data that uh, the AWARS determined uh, with uh, through the use of the farm labor survey and we're trying to deal with some of this stuff at the federal level right now and um, so just be be wary of that okay the pandemic has obviously created some additional issues and it's expected to to continue on through the 2020 year 2021 year so um, Please be mindful of that. That's all I'm going to say about trade so, or about labor. So now trade issues. Let's start off with China. Um, what more do I need to say? We know that they completely pulled out uh, from the U.S. here uh, a year or two ago. Um, it seems like they might be dipping their toes back in and we're going to talk about some of the reasons or you're going to see some of those reasons why they might be dipping their toes back in. Uh, right now, it's been, or what seems like from what we're hearing, a very limited basis, but there is potential hope. But we have a newer problem that did arise, and that's the EU. EU placed 25% tariff on the importation of U.S. tobacco, and that really stems from uh, issues that arose from subsidies that the U.S. was providing to Boeing and then back to France with Airbus, and uh, we essentially lost a WTO uh, trade dispute, um, and the EU won, which allowed them to go ahead and place some significant tariffs um, on U.S. products, and uh, those U.S. products, one of which is tobacco. 
All right, let's move on. Global market for tobacco products in 2019. Here is our breakdown. Uh, this is sourced through Euromonitor. And again, thank you to uh, Dr. Blake Brown for uh, garnering this information and letting me use this. Um, so that's where we're presently sitting at. Um, obviously, cigarettes um, are still the largest of the bunch, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that are coming in. Here, we're able to see some of the prevalence by region uh, of what's taking place uh, with smokers. And, um, you know, although we're seeing some stagnation uh, over the past, you know, four or five years and what's anticipated to happen in the future, uh, decreases are still continuing. All right, here we're taking a look at um, our tobacco products. Uh, these two charts are broken down based off of product. Um, where we are in 19, starting in 19, and the expectations on the changes of product use by category on volume. And then the bottom right corner um, is taking a look at the value. So although in many cases um, we're seeing some of, especially take a look at the blue line cigarettes, all right? World volume outlook by category is dropping, uh, but one of the things that we're noticing and the expectation is the value of that, even with the decrease um, in volume usage, is that the value itself is staying relatively stable. All right. Low heat burn units uh, receive FDA modified risk tobacco product sta uh, status. Um, and so we're gonna look to see, and we're gonna be watching to see how this plays out with its use, okay? Let's start looking at flu cured tobacco. So these are uh, 2020 total acres harvested. Um, and if we take a look at 2020 or, or across the years, but if we take a look specifically at 2020, um, Again, it is lower, um, which is not necessarily unexpected. And the different colors, as you can see, um, are each of the different major states, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. South Carolina is yellow and Virginia in blue. No surprise there. When we take a look at the South Carolina, and especially after the contracts law, as, as expected, uh, we are continuing to see a decrease in the acres harvested. Now we begin to take a look at tobacco price per pound and obviously, um, you know, this is coming from um, NAS uh, survey, annual survey that's done. And many of you fully understand the difference between the contracted and uncontracted price. Um, and we're continuing to be able, we're continuing to see uh, blue is South Carolina, the orange is the US. Um, we are continuing to see a decrease there as well. Now, if we begin to take a look at and, and show the acres harvested and the price, um, again, no surprise, just in essence, disappointment. You know, this is very, very different than what we were seeing many years ago that I remember. Uh, where I was raising tobacco and that was paying for the groceries on the table for the farm and anything that I made off of my other rotational crops, um, corn, beans, etc., was gravy. And now it looks like, um, you know, and, and I don't have to tell all of you this, that those issues and, and those times are gone. Okay. So uh, flu cured tobacco production, when I take a look at pounds being produced, again, this is looking uh, at Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. We're at about uh, just under 235 million pounds between those states. Uh, South Carolina was right around the 9.6 million pounds. Um, and so obviously we're continuing to see that, which obviously makes sense. Uh, given the acreage numbers changed. So let's continue to take a look at flu cured tobacco supply and demand. So if we take a look at Brazil and Zimbabwe's tobacco production, um, we are seeing some changes there. And, um, you know, we, we are, you know, there's some estimates and, and concern with regards to quality in some of these other locations outside the U.S. 
Um, but we're also seeing some of the uh, decreasing um, production there as well. Now, if we begin to take a look at the China imports of tobacco between Brazil, the US and Zimbabwe, um, and this is looking at 2017 through January to July of 2020, um, you notice obviously they are not importing any US tobacco. Um, and you could also see because of, you know, there's questions on whether or not the quality was there for Brazil and if that is the cause of what has taken place in the first half of 2020 or um, were there other issues? Did they over purchase to, to be able to increase their stocks? Do they have enough, which is not necessarily uncommon for various commodities of what China does. All right, so if we begin to take a look at the value of imports of US um, tobacco, here's what I want you to kind of take away from on this. Obviously, China um, is there and quickly cut out, but take a look at Germany. Germany is quite meaningful to US tobacco for their imports, and Japan is not far behind Germany as well. Um, however, with, with some exceptions, with some exceptions, uh, we are continuing to see uh, predominantly decreasing um, importations. Obviously, we see the jumps in 2018 uh, in Indonesia, Turkey, uh, Mexico. Um, and so, but we, we need to pay attention and watch Germany. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit here in a moment. And as I stated a little bit earlier, um, that 25% tariff has really hurt us and has the potential to significantly decrease the purchases from EU countries of US tobacco, okay? As we continue to move forward, US flu cured, uh, cured uh, tobacco on manufactured exports, China and the rest of the world. Um, you can kind of see the continued decreases here, and um, it, it's pretty painful in what this means for us uh, with the demand for U.S. tobacco. So again, um, this is Switzerland. Switzerland isn't necessarily a huge user of U.S. tobacco, but they uh, do import um, tobacco, and then it actually flows through Switzerland and moves on to some of the other European countries. And so, um, you know, this is relatively meaningful to us. Um, granted, not quite as much as it would be like if it was Germany, um, but this is something that we need, need to watch, watch for, um, and it's continuing to decrease. Value of imports to some of those other countries, again, um, another, just another method of showing the imports of US tobacco. Um, not exactly the best news for us. So contracted pounds for 2021. Um, worst case scenario, China does not resume purchases or is very limited and the US, uh, the EU tariff uh, issue not resolved, all right? Contracted pounds would decline again. However, what we've been hearing, it seems like by some of those that have started discussions or have begun to receive some of those contracts, um, they seem to be at least on initial um, uh, uh, initial basis that it might be somewhat similar to last year. Um, a mid case EU tariff not resolved. China begins to resume purchases. Uh, non EU buyers increases purchases of U.S. tobacco as EU bids tobacco away in other markets. Net effect on contracted pounds would be uncertain. Best case scenario: China resumes purchases. We get the EU issue resolved and those contracted pounds begin to finally increase. And so if the stars align, we could be relatively optimistic. Um, on, you know, we're, we're starting to see the contracts flow right now, but what that would also mean is um, some of those uncontracted tobacco production may see slightly better prices than we have been seeing uh, at auction. All right, now that being said, I can also be struck by lightning twice in the same spot. So just be wary of that. 
Um, I'm not going to spend some time here because um, I believe we have somebody that's going to talk about crop insurance. So we'll talk about that. We'll let somebody else talk about that. So my quick takeaways from the outlook piece is continued decline in demand for combustibles. Um, new technologies contain less tobacco per unit, and that is coming from tobacco that is not necessarily grown um, uh, here in the US. A lot of it is coming from other parts of the world. Rumors of China's return, but how robust is that gonna be? Exports to other buyers continue to go down. 25% um, tariff on the EU is going to cause additional decline in those exports into the EU. EU. And as I stated earlier, if you took a look at Germany, um, how much is that going to affect Germany's purchase purchases? I expect that it could be somewhat substantial, but it's also going to be very dependent on where are they going to go. If Brazil has low quality, do they really want to import some of Brazil's? And China seems to have a pretty good hold um, <clears throat> in, in Zimbabwe, in Africa. And are they going to be able to access some of those markets? And if they do, and China is still in need of some of that tobacco, um, where is China going to go? Is that an opportunity for China to have some other access points, other countries that will purchase from the US and move some of that tobacco into China, which you know, within the last couple of years, China has threatened some of the uh, other countries not to do that, okay? Uh, do we expect any production without a contract to decrease? Yeah, I, I believe I would expect that. Um, just simply based off of what we've seen, prices on, at, you know, at the auctions, quote unquote, um, on some of that uncontracted tobacco. Uh, review your budgets. Where can we cut expenses without affecting yield? Or can we cut expenses at a greater ratio uh, or cost that may decline my yield, but um, the cost of, of cutting that yield outweighs the, the yield loss. And so that really needs you to, you know, means you have to crunch some of those numbers. Overall trend continuing to decline. Contracted pounds, we'll have to wait to see what, how that ends up. But if the stars align, uh, we can see some positives out of that. Now, something that I sneak in now with the bulk of the talks that I do, and, and it's extremely important, okay? And so please, please just bear with me. Um, you know, the following is from a new national research poll that American Farm Bureau has conducted with Morning Consult. Two in three farmers and farm workers, 66% say that the pandemic has impacted their mental health. Uh, those numbers even prior to the pandemic were, were um, alarming, okay? The percentage of farmers, farm workers who say social isolation impacts their mental health has increased 22% since April of 19. Um, farmers and farm workers were 10% more likely than rural adults as a whole to have experienced feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge during the pandemic. Two thirds of rural adults between ages of 18 and 44 say they are personally experiencing more mental health challenges than they were a year ago. More than half of rural adults and farmers and farm workers say they are personally experiencing more mental health challenges compared to a year ago. And again, a year ago, those stats were alarming prior to the pandemic. Half of rural residents aged 18 to 34 saying they've thought more about their mental health during COVID pandemic, more than any other age group. <clears throat> now, why am I bringing this up? I'm gonna start off, this is a topic that is relatively meaningful to me. Prior to coming here to South Carolina, I'm in my, I think, fourth year here. Um, the state that I was in, we went through a rash of suicide and suicide attempts by farmers, farmer spouses, and farmer family members. Um, this is a topic that is not usually discussed, and I think we have to get over this. There have been, even since I have been here in South Carolina and Georgia, I am aware of um, suicides that have taken place within our ag communities. Um, and there's a number of suicides that don't get marked as suicides. They get marked down as farm accidents. Um, however, um, 
you know, we, we very well know that that was not the case in some of those circumstances, all right? I've seen the harm of what this can do if it is not acknowledged and dealt with on the personal level, all right? I am not gonna go through my normal 90 minute talk. This is just very, very brief, all right? I, would, I, I am asking everybody that is on today, just take a quick gander at this. Um, I know that many of you will be able to say, yes, I am seeing this in me, in a family member, in a neighbor, um, whomever it happens to be, all right? The idea, stress affects our bodies physically, physiologically, mentally, whether we want to acknowledge that it does or not, all right? Here are some of those signs and symptoms when they begin to really begin to boil up. We see changes in routines, care of the farmstead, of our livestock, our crops, um, increase in illness, cold, and especially during a pandemic, this is a big one. Okay, it makes you more susceptible to these types of things. We see increases in farm incidences. Children, you know, no matter how much you're trying to hide the farm, the stress of what's taking place on the farm financially, et cetera, we don't realize it, but everybody around you also feels that stress coming off of you. Mom always said, take a deep breath when you're angry. <laughs> You know, that actually works. It does something in the brain. Um, Self-talking, optimism, all right, meditation, um, actual exercise, and I'm not talking about throwing hay bales like we used to do or working cows, um, helps connect with people in your social network. Obviously, that's more difficult now, but you all still have a phone. I know most of you carry it in your back pocket or on your belt, okay? And it's all right to speak with a mental health professional. All right, check on your family, check on your neighbors. A call is all it takes. Try some of the simple things mom used to say, like that deep breath. Try to find a hobby or an outlet. I know many of us, the farm is consuming. There is always something that needs to be done on the farm. Um, I am taken up, I am a workaholic. Um, you know, but sometimes, you know, my happy place, my church for me is standing in the middle of a river chasing trout, trout or being with buddies in a field. And I haven't done this in three years um, going after birds and I am far from the best shot. But those are my happy places that take me away that that I can stop thinking about everything else that is going on. And there's no shame in asking for help. All right, one, I need to say thank you to South Carolina Farm Bureau. They have provided funding to myself and my team. Um, we do offer some farm stress mental health programs that are 90 minutes long, an hour long um, to help with some of this stuff and to help us um, also, part of the farm stress is not knowing necessarily we know we're having issues, but we really can't begin to figure out what's taking place. Myself, Scott Mickey, and some of others on my team are willing to meet with you and do full-fledged farm analysis to be able to assist you in figuring out some of those things. You may still not like what the numbers show, but you can begin to actually see and understand what's taking place and begin to ask some of those other relevant questions that need to be asked. Also, South Carolina Farm Bureau has helped start a program called South Carolina Agro Wellness. You do not need to be a Farm Bureau member. All you have to be is a part of the South Carolina Ag community. You can call up that 1-800 number and you reference South Carolina Agro Wellness. They will put you into contact with a, a counselor, a mental health expert that has gone through some training that is specific for them to have a little bit better understanding about farming, farm families, farm communities, um, and receive at least um, a minimum, uh, receive three free counseling centers. Please, please 
feel free and please reach out if necessary. There are some links there. Um, that Clemson extension link has a number of resources that myself and counterparts developed when I was still at another institution. Um, just read through those resources. Hopefully it will be useful to somebody, okay? If you want to contact me, um, do not contact me at the office. I will type in, um, I will type in my cell phone number in the chat. Um, David DeWitt and William Hardy also have that. Feel free to contact me. Okay, and that is all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, appreciate it, Adam. We're going to uh, move right along here. Francis got back online and um, I'm going to hand it off to him and we'll get pushed through this thing. Thanks, Matt. I'll try again to uh, share my screen here. Um, yeah, it's not the first time my computer has crashed, and I apologize for that, but it's the first time it's crashed at the, uh, at the perfect moment like that. So let me here put this full screen. Can everyone see this? Yep, I got it. Great, okay. Well, I'll be brief. I'm just going to provide a, a brief overview of some principles of uh, insect management and uh, talk about some of our main pests of, uh, of tobacco. And one thing I like to talk about, uh, whether I'm um, talking about insect management in tobacco or other crops, is the, uh, the value of um, conserving natural enemies. Um, in any given field, whether it's tobacco or any of our main crops, uh, the majority of the pests in the field can often be eliminated by uh, the action of natural enemies, of other arthropods in the field. And so to maximize their impacts, um, it's important to minimize the use of insecticides, right? Since insecticides often have a, um, a broad spectrum of activity and can be harmful for not just the target pest, um, but also for, um, for other beneficial insects. And so monitoring of fields, of course, scouting is important, uh, you know, rather than using say calendar-based applications of insecticide, um, when selecting an insecticide, um, it's important to think about, you know, the impact uh, on beneficial insects. And this, of course, is challenging, um, you know, for any crop, but particularly when we have fewer options than maybe we used to um, for some, for some cases. And, you know, budworms and hornworms, which are probably, you know, some of our most consistent pests for sure, they can be taken out, you know, um, by uh, up to 80, 90 percent by natural enemies. So this is something to consider when, um, you know, making management decisions. And of course, you know, Khatija being one of our most visible uh, natural enemies of, of hornworms, but there's many, many, many others. And these are just a few examples of some of our predators we have in tobacco and also some of our other crops as well. I like to talk about spine soldier bugs versus stink bugs, since they do look fairly similar. Uh, the spine soldier bug is a super common natural enemy. Um, it's present in all of our cropping systems. And it looks a lot like the brown stink bug, which is one of our most common pests uh, in corn, uh, cotton, soybean, tobacco. Um, and you can see here an immature, on the left, an immature spine soldier bug feeding on a a larva of a, of a pest. And so to tell the difference, they look fairly similar. You can just flip them over and look at the mouth parts with the predator having a much larger mouth part than the plant feeding a brown stink bug right here. So moving on just briefly, um, aphid and flea beetle control, you know, they used to be um, um, major pests. But I think now that probably most of you, if not all of you are using in the greenhouse, uh, a mitocloprid, which is admire pro, or a generic brand, or thiamethoxam, which is platinum, um, which are two neonicotinoid insecticides. So they provide long control, you know, during the season of aphids and flea beetles uh, for most of the season often. Um, and we do have these thresholds, which are included in our production guide. And we do have insecticides, fortunately, um, should um, outbreaks occur. Um, I want to mention a, a newer product, Verimark, which I'll mention in a minute, which is also um, available for flea beetle control. Uh, but most of the decisions we'll be making concern, you know, hornworms and budworms, and we have a range of products available. And I like to talk about um, 
you know, some of the value of some of our uh, more narrow spectrum um, insecticides in yellow here, and of course the BT insecticides such as Javelin or Dipel, they probably have the least impact on all of our natural enemies. Some of the older products like Orthene and Warrior will of course, um, with a much broader spectrum of activity, will be more harmful. But we have, you know, we do have available options, uh, Denim, um, Blackhawk, Corrigen, I mean, they're fairly specific for, um, for hornworms and birdworms. And I, we do include in our production guide uh, the, uh, these mode of action codes from the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. So a different, a different uh, mode of action, a different code indicates a different mode of action. So we do recommend when possible, when making multiple applications during the season is to uh, change mode of actions between the first and second um, application. A lot of you have been using Corrigen over the years, and I like to, to mention this. It's, um, of course, as you know, has systemic activity for budworms, hornworms, and splitworms. And um, how valuable it is will depend on, you know, when the pests show up, right? If the pests, you're making that proactive decision prior to knowing when those pests are going to show up. And so, um, um, but in our trials, we've seen on average about six weeks activity after transplant. Uh, water uh, in the soil is key since when uh, without enough water the insecticide will sit in the soil and will not be absorbed by the plant and will not be effective. Um, so it's important to follow the label with 100 gallons of water per acre. Um, and in some cases we've seen more than six weeks. Um, it just really depends on, on the conditions of, of, that, of your field and, 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 the, and the weather also. But it's often helped to delay or save, um, you know, one application for budworms and hornworms. Now, a fairly new product is cyanotranilipril, uh, which is a similar product to uh, Corrigen. Um, and there are two formulations. One, x is uh, labeled for as a foliar product for hornworms, budworms, and flea beetles, whereas Verimark is a formulation for our plant applications. Um, and it also helps to suppress tomato spotted wilt, the virus. So, you know, it's similar to Corrigen, but it's a different mode of action, a slightly different um, product. And then, so it has a slightly broader spectrum of activity, as you can see by including flea beetles on the label, which Corrigen does not. I also like to mention that, you know, the hazard to the applicator, the potential threat of injury from using insecticides. It's really important to read the label and follow those recommendations carefully. And one thing to pay attention to is the WHO pesticide class, um, which indicates you know, how um, um, the relative hazard from using these products. So products such as Orthene, Admire, Pyrethroids, they're in the WHO class two, whereas some of these slightly safer products, the Blackhawk BT insecticides are in class three. So those are important things to you know, consider before using a, a, a product. And of course, resistance is a major issue for many um, insects and insecticides, since we have many, many species have over time ev um, evolved um, to, you know, to resistance to a number of insecticides, um, which is why I just mentioned the modes of, modes of action and the need to rotate and minimize the use of insecticides. And we only have a handful of um, insecticides that are effective, right? And it's becoming harder and harder and more expensive to get new active ingredients labeled um, for whatever crop we're talking about. And so we need to preserve the ones um, that are working for us. And I'm gonna just um, talk briefly about tomato spotted wilt. Um, Dr. J. Michael Moore um, talked about managing uh, spotted wilt in tobacco and, um, and um, the value of using Admire Pro. And um, as he mentioned, the, um, you know, the efficacy of using um, Admire Pro does vary greatly. Uh, in this case, this should be percentage of plants infected. Uh, we had a 27% reduction in platinum and 50% with Admire Pro, which is on the decent side when we look at how effective these products are, with Admire Pro generally being um, slightly more effective than platinum. But we do recommend using you know, these products as they, they help to suppress spotted wilt. And they also provide, of course, the control of other pests such as um, aphids and, and flea beetles. And um, 
Dr. J. Michael Moore also mentioned ActiGuard, uh, which can be used in the greenhouse. Um, it's really important to follow the labeled rate. As, of course, as you know, stunting can occur, although plants do generally recover. Um, and um, it can be used in the field. Um, you know, I've, we've talked about this before. Oops, I just exited full screen. Um, it only has 10 to 14 days activity and it takes a few days for the plant uh, to have these defenses activated. So there is um, a model tool developed by NC State, which I know some of you have used in the past. So I'm just gonna mention it here again. Um, if you haven't used it, you know, you, you, you may wanna give it a go to see whether it works for you. And so what it does, it uses um, uh, the weather data and you can select on this website here, select your field, enter your um, uh, planting date and it will pull weather data from the closest weather station and it will provide predictions for when um, the predicted um, flight of thrips occur after transplant and since it's thrips that transmit the virus it can help to time applications of ActiGuard um, after, after transplant so it can be a useful tool and it has been adapted in the last couple of years also for use in cotton where it can help to predict, um, a, a, sim a different tool can help to predict the risk from injury to seedling cotton. So that's a nice tool for when you're making decisions to, um, uh, to optimize the use of inputs on cotton on your farm. And I'm gonna stop right there because I know we've uh, run a little bit behind and th this tool also shows the historical risk from tomato spotted wilt virus. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Appreciate it, Francis. Sorry we had that, uh, <laughs> that interruption there. But it's, and I, uh, just to follow up, I see that um, uh, Michael Jordan from FMC mentioned Stuart, which may be labeled um, for tobacco um, for this coming season. And that's good news to hear. And it's a product we have looked at um, in past years. So we're, we're happy to see this. Agreed. Thanks, Francis. I know with uh, uh, CPAs in general, uh, I think in the tobacco world, we can, we'll take anything we can get at this point. Uh, so right. appreciate that. Um, sure. All right. Uh, Chris Stevens, Farm Plus Insurance. I think we'll wrap us up. Um, we'll let you have, have the mic here. Okay. Give me just a minute to get my screen up. Okay, can everybody, can y'all see my screen? Yep, got a uh, PowerPoint up. Yep, right. there we go. So I know it's already been mentioned a couple of times here today, but uh, you know, we are gonna see some changes to the flu cure crop insurance policy for 2021. Probably some of the biggest changes that we've seen to the crop insurance program. Um, you know, a lot you know, was mentioned earlier, um, there will be two price elections, or, or let's say multiple price elections for uh, our non-contracted tobacco or tobacco without a valid contract. We're going to have a 90 cent price election. That price selection could be increased up to a dollar 80 for contracted tobacco. So non-contracted tobacco, you know, it is what it sounds like. You know, tobacco without a contract or without a vowed contract. Uh, new for 2021, non-contracted tobacco will not be eligible for quality adjustment. So for you know, folks that have gotten used to you know, going through tags and AMS for quality adjustment on their crop insurance, if you don't have a contract, you will not be eligible for quality adjustment in 2021. So on contracted tobacco, quality adjustment will be available. There'll be a dollar eighty price selection for the pounds on the contract. If a producer overplants their contract, they'll receive an, a weighted average price. So the actual price selection on the policy may not be a dollar eighty. You know, depending on you know your planning situation, and we'll get into that in just a you know a few more slides. So over planting contract, you know, so if you're a producer that plants, you know, 
some extra acres, you know, so that you've got some good tobacco to take, you know, your buyers. You know, if you, we'll get into a, you know, a weighted average price selection. This price selection is going to vary for each producer. You know, it's going to depend on their APH that they have on their individual farms. It's going to be based on you know, the amount of acreage that they actually overplant and the amount of tobacco they have on a contract. So we'll get into an example here you know, on how this weighted average price selection will work. So let's say a producer has a contract for 100,000 pounds. They plant 60 acres of tobacco. They got a 2,000 pound price selection. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 2,000 pound APH. So you're gonna multiply your 60 acres times a 2,000 pound average yield. You know, you're expecting 120,000 pounds of tobacco. But you know, we had the 100,000 pound contract. So here's how this, uh, this calculation is gonna work. We're gonna take our 100,000 pounds of contracted to tobacco times $1.80 cent. So that's gonna give us 180,000. We're gonna take our overage are 20,000 pounds times 90 cent. That's 18,000. We're going to add the two, two together. So we come up with uh, 198,000. We're going to divide by 120,000, our total pounds expected. And that's going to give us a $1.65 price selection. So as you see, you know, that $1.80, you know, that's actually going to be a maximum price selection that you're going to see for, for conventional tobacco. If you know, if you underplant your contract or plant only you know the contracted pounds, then you're going to have the dollar eighty. But most people is going to you know, see something a little less depending on their situation. Now in this case, you know this dollar sixty five price selection, you know it applies across all units. So you don't have you know some units, some farms with a dollar eighty price selection and some with a 90 cent. You know, it's gonna be a weighted average. It's gonna apply across the board. But if a producer has conventional tobacco and organic tobacco, you know, they're gonna be looked at and calculated separately, you know, based off of those contracts. So what is a valid contract? You know, to start with, and RMA has already told us, you know, they're gonna put a lot of emphasis on this. Um, you know, we've had some, some calls with uh, the Raleigh Regional Office and the Valdosta Regional Office, you know, and they're saying that they're going to pay a whole lot of attention to these contracts. So to start with, the name on the contract, you know, if we're, you the grower needs to, needs to match the name on the policy. Yes, this is a pretty big deal. So, you know, just an example here, you know, if I've got a crop insurance policy for Chris Stevens Farms, I need to have on my contract, you know, Chris Stevens Farms. You know, right now is a, an important time to get this right. You know, we've got a February 28th sales closing date and, you know, you're getting contracts right now or, or hopefully over the next few weeks. You need to make sure that those, uh, you know, those match. You know, if you need to adjust one, you know, now's the time to take care of it. So a valid contract, you know, for crop insurance purposes is a written agreement between you, the farmer, and the processor, and it must contain a minimum of your commitment to grow the tobacco, you know, the processor's commitment to purchase the, the tobacco, and then we got to see some pounds on there. And, uh, you know, getting a little more into the validity of the contract on the buyer side, um, again, this is a pretty big deal. RMA that has gone into a lot of detail on what they consider a, you know, a valid buyer and, uh, you know, kind of really laid it out in some specifics. You know, they usually don't like to do a whole lot of reading, but, you know, with them going into so much detail, I figured I'd just, you know, copy and paste their definition. You know, but basically they're saying that, uh, number one, you know, these companies have to have a permit or license with the Alcohol and Tobacco uh, Tax and Trade Bureau. Through them, they're issued a TTB number. You know, so they've got to have that TTB number. To, to get a 
to process tobacco in the United States, to manufacture tobacco in the United States, to import or export, you have to have a TTB number. And for most of our, our buyers, you know, they're covered. You know, either they're manufacturing themselves or they're you know, involved in the import or export of tobacco somehow. So, so you're good. You know, most of your bigger names, you know, your Philip Marsh, your Reynolds, uh, you know, Alliance, uh, even CTI, you know, we're covered. But for some of your, your smaller leaf buyers, you know, this could be a big deal. This is something, you know, we're going to have to check in, you know, for each individual buyer to make sure we're covered. So, uh, you know, as you're getting your contracts, you need to make sure that you're asking if they have a TTB number or, you know, if you contact me or, or the local RMA office, you know, we can help you out on those. You know, we've been checking into quite a few already. Um, you know, going in, you know, just expanding a little further their definition of a processor. So your contract has to be between you, the grower and a processor. It really gets in some, some specifics here on, on the definition of a processor, you know, into the requirement to have uh, the permits for processing or, or manufacturing the products. You know, that entity must own their facilities and have the equipment to, to process the tobacco in a reasonable amount of time. I don't know if they're really gonna get into checking on that I mean, but it is written into the policy. So we don't know what's going to come later on. You know, the number one thing is we've been told that they're, they're going to be on the lookout for these TTB numbers and um, you know, state and federal licenses. So just you know, going on a little further on the TTB number, it needs to be in, the TTB number needs to be for the entity issuing the contract. So we run into a little issue earlier this week, you know, we were checking on a, on a buyer to see if they were covered. And it was kind of, kind of, kind of a weird deal. You know, that particular buyer didn't have a TTB number, but they operated, you know, in partnership with another, another entity that did. So uh, just an example, you know, say I'm, I'm a buyer of tobacco, I've got two entities. You know, Chris Stevens Tobacco Exchange does not have a TTB number. But I've got another entity, you know, Loris Tobacco Exporters, that does have a TTB number. If I issue contracts to you, the grower, under Chris Stevens Tobacco Exchange, you don't have a valid contract. You know, in that case, I need to be issuing contracts under Loris Tobacco Exporters or somehow somehow have uh, Loris Tobacco exporters on that Chris Stevens Tobacco Exchange contract. You know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we need, to, we need to verify these TTB numbers ASAP. You know, the way this thing's gonna work out is you're gonna have to issue your contracts to your crop insurance agent. Uh, you know, they're gonna have to come in at acreage reporting time, you know, mid-July, your agents, your, the AIPs have a certain period of time it takes to, to process all the acreage reports, all the contracts. And from what we're being told is that uh, these contracts will have to be entered into a pass system. This is a system that RMA utilizes now to verify social security numbers, they verify you know, farm serial numbers, they verify names of entities are correct. And you know, if they're not, they kick back an error. Well, it's not going to be until possibly late August before, you know, some of this information's entered. You, know, you don't want to find out after, you know, a crop's been harvested and is out of the field that you've got a 90% price selection when you're expecting a dollar eighty. So again, you know, make sure you check into this, you know, ASAP. Just going to try to answer a few, you know, a few questions maybe for you. This was just copied and pasted right off of RMA's website. You know, it asks, you know, what if I grow fluke tobacco under, under a valid contract and later sell some or all of my crop to another entity? All right, in that, that case, you know, there's no impact on your crop insurance. 
So if you've got a contract with with, uh, with Philip Morris, they're putting threes and fours on all of your tobacco, and you've got you know a rental contract, or you got a, you know another option to, to sell some tobacco at a higher price. Because you have that original contract, you're covered. It's not going to mess you up. You know what if I have a flu cure contract under a you know and the buyer stops taking tobacco you know, before the end of the season. Well, you, again, that's not going to have an impact on your crop insurance, but you know, that's not in, you know, an insurable cause of loss either. Just back up, you know, throwing one more out real quick. You know, let's say, uh, you know, I've got a valid contract, but you know, my son wants to grow tobacco. You know, me having a valid contract, you know, isn't considered valid, you know, for the purposes of my son's crop insurance. Again, we got to make sure that the names on the contracts, you know, match, uh, you know, what's on the crop insurance policy. Moving on to quality adjustment, you know, for those with, with a contracted, you know, with contracted tobacco, quality adjustments can work just like it did in the past. You know, quality adjustments can be limited to the amount of contracted pounds, however. So if you got a contract for 100,000 pounds and you grew 120,000 pounds of tobacco, you, know, you can only get 100,000 pounds quality adjusted. The other 20,000 pounds that you grew, you know, it'll be counted pound for pound. You know, just like before, Tags will still be handling the scheduling. AMS graders are still grading. Uh, quality adjustment discount factors will remain the same as they have in the past. Nothing new there. Just moving on real quick. I know this came out last year. You know, a lot of you guys took advantage of it. I think there were like 957 uh, hurricane insurance policies sold on flu cured tobacco last year. That's only about half of, you know, the total number of policies. You know, it's something you guys really need to pay attention to. Um, you know, it could be, uh, you know, very worthwhile for you. 65% subsidized, that's a big deal. You know, you got the government paying a big portion of your premium. So hurricane insurance protection, it pays a, a payment if you receive hurricane force winds in your county or an adjacent county, so that's 74 mile per hour or greater. You know, this is winds from a name storm. This isn't from a, you know, a thunderstorm or a cold front moving through. These payments are made quick too. They're made usually within 30 days of, of that hurricane or that event. Um, you know, you're not waiting till the next year, you know, like next July or August, like you are with some other uh, programs that we're used to. You know, just an example of how this hurricane, you know, payment could shake out, you know, the amount that you could see. If you've got a 70% coverage level policy with a 2,000 pound APH, well, that pretty much gives you a, a coverage range of 95 to 70%. So it drops down to the percent of coverage that you have on your policy. So there's a 25% hit coverage range, 25% of 2,000 pounds, would you know be 500 pounds? If you've got a price selection of a dollar 80 cent, you know, if you got all contracted tobacco, that could be a 900 dollar an acre payment. So this is a pretty huge deal. And just kind of showing some of the historicals, you know, going back to you know Hurricane Hugo in 1989, uh, you know, there's quite a few events that would have paid. And, you know, of course, last year was the first year of the policy. And it did pay. You know, from Hugo to now, we're averaging a hurricane every 2.8 years. I mean, pretty much looks like, you know, based on hi historical information, if history, you know, holds true over the next few years, we've got a one in three odds of receiving a payment. And at the same time, you know, one hit payment is equal to about 15 or more years of premium, depending on your location. So one in three odds for about a 1,500% payout. You know, I, I would definitely put a quarter in that machine if I were in Vegas and I'm not a gambling man. ECO, 
Some of you may have heard of this. ECO uh, come out this year. This is uh, another option that pays up to 95%. You know, something that we're not used to. Typically we're used to seeing, you know, 75% or 85% coverage maximums. ECO is not available with HIP or the Hurricane Insurance Protection, but it is a good option for those growers west of I-95 that uh, the hurricane insurance may not be quite as favorable for. Uh, the amount of ECO coverage that you would have, you know, it varies by producers based on your individual liability, you know, the policy, the, the yields that you have, the coverage you know, that you have in place. And it pretty much adds a band of coverage from 86% up to 95%. It can, you know, and if you've got a supplemental coverage option or SEO, it'll, it'll cover, you know, from your coverage level, let's say 75%, up to 95 percent. This is a pretty big deal. I had a, a lunch with uh, Sonny Purdue last fall. Uh, I know they're looking at uh, programs like this to potentially do away with some of the ad hoc disaster programs that we've seen in the past like WIP and WIP Plus. You know, they're wanting, the USDA is wanting the farmer to have some skin in the game. So as we see more of these programs come out like this, you're probably gonna to wanna to take advantage of them because with these being offered, they're probably less likely to offer, you know, continued WIP payments or programs similar to that. And, you know, just wanted to rush through this for the sake of time. I, you know, here's my phone number, my email. You know, if you got any questions on these crop insurance changes, you know, be sure to, you know, give me a call, talk to your crop insurance agent. Um, you know, we'd be glad to help you out in any way possible. And I'll turn things up back over to, to Matt. Appreciate it, Chris. Yeah, make sure uh, that, that's a lot of important, a lot of valuable information definitely moving forward. So thank you, Chris, for, for providing that and, and for the growers. Um, definitely reach out to him if you got any questions. Um, I know we're running a little long here. Appreciate y'all hanging on uh, with us. And we're going to wrap up. Catherine Helms with the South Carolina Department of Ag is going to make just a few comments here, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Go ahead, Catherine. Hey, y'all. I'm Catherine Helms. In case you don't know me, I'm the director of the South Carolina Tobacco Board. I've been working with the Tobacco Board since May of last year. Excuse my dog barking in the background. Perks of working from home, obviously. Um, and so just wanted to let y'all know who I am. Um, I'm normally stationed at the State House in Columbia, but if you ever need to get in touch with me or interested about the Tobacco Board, just Google South Carolina Tobacco Board, and it'll be the first link that pops up through the South Carolina Department of Ag. So I'll turn it back over to you, Matt. All right, thanks, Catherine. All right. Uh, again, uh, I know we ran a little bit long, uh, and and once again appreciate you hanging hanging with us. Is any